I need your help. My cousin's been cursed. I unbound a book to save him. You gonna save them all? Drop it. Duncan and both come correct. So his fucking socks delivered at that time. But the email come through, your parcel's been delivered, clocked the date, you know, the, the date and the time. And then about five minutes later, how was your experience? Please rate the driver. And there's no rating on it for poor. It's just like you either click to see you accept that he was a good delivery driver, uh, he delivered things promptly, he obeyed the, you know, the rules of you know, the delivery, etc. So all these tick on boxes. So like they'll never get bad feedback. Yeah, so it's how is your driver, good driver or the best driver? Yeah, literally, yeah. So if you don't tick it, I imagine it's, well, the person couldn't be bothered filling that in. So uh, they're just, they're, they honestly are like the, the, the wild west of delivery companies. But I think they're cheap and cheerful, which is why a lot of people send with them. A lot of companies just like send it Hermes, save, save some of those pennies on the delivery. And um, yeah, you get that on the customer side. And you never know if Hermes is delivering because when you buy something, it just says, you know, 48, uh, you know, 48 hours express delivery and you click yes. It doesn't tell you who the courier is. Like on American sites, it usually tells you who the courier is. And yeah. In the UK, it doesn't. It just tells you that it'll be delivered within 40 hours. And then, <laughs> then it's Russian roulette to find out <laughs> fucking the delivery people are. Oh, man. So there you go. I, I just don't know how you survive. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's a hard life, bro. I'll tell you what's a hard life, Duncan. Duncan, about come correct, <laughs> which is the show we're doing right now. This, uh, this season, of course, Duncan and Bo go to Lovecraft Country. Um, yeah, this is the final episode, Bo. Yeah, our finale. The big finale of this season. And I think we should get a little bit of business out of the way. Oh, dear, be snatch up front. <laughs> what? That's That sounded filthy. It always is. <laughs> I don't know that I ever really thought about the sexual connotation until right now. Yeah, so it's dripping out of it. Don't, so I dunk it. <laughs> It's we're we're not five minutes into the show, and you're already talking Ball about deep. yeah yeah. <sighs> so uh, the business at hand, Duncan. Mm-hmm. We have official merch for this season. We we do. I, I I saw. I've seen people wearing said merch and posting pictures. And you know what I thought? That's great. Wouldn't it be better if more people bought? Right. Merch? So so here's the deal. <laughs> In fairness, all right, let, let's just let's just put this out there. I didn't really tell you we were going to do a shirt. I was just fucking around one day and put a shirt together. And I was like, you know who would love this? Duncan. Mm. And then uh, I put it up on the store. And then somebody was wearing it. I was like, oh, shit, I never told Duncan about this shirt I was doing. So, well, what I like is like, you, you missed a vital... Vital bit of information here. You put it up on the store, mm. tee hee hee, and then yeah, you, know, you missed your tee hee hee because that's what I imagine I'm doing. You put it in, I'm just gonna put this in. Yeah, awesome. well, I just like I said, I was just kind of fucking around with it and uh, with the design, and then it was mm-hmm. like, and I, like from finishing design to having it on the storefront was like seven minutes, <laughs> so it was a little <laughs> impulsive. But folks, you can. Here's the thing. You can get yourself a Duncan and Bo Go to Lovecraft Country uh, t-shirt. I was wearing mine just earlier. Uh, it has mm. a little a little uh, cutesy kind of Cthulhu on the front. Uh, I think it's got a little bit of barbecue sauce in it now. Yeah. It's not anymore. It's, kinda, uh, it's got a, a cord on the cob on it. <laughs> that I dropped. Half a tuna sandwich. <laughs> Uh, that all comes with it, and uh, but it's a hundred percent cotton shirt. It's a, a, a good shirt, um, and and basically Duncan and I are splitting the profits. So <laughs> you know that's how it works. So if yeah, both already put a down payment down on a much larger property than he's already very large property. So um, we're not saying that you know it's reliant on you buying a t shirt, but you know. Look, the reason I'm bringing this up is because we need to move some units here. Uh, <laughs> you know, we got a couple of sales out of it, and uh, and then it kind of flatlined. Um, so, <laughs> so if you want to make it a Merry Christmas, and and hey, you could probably <laughs> you could probably get one of these shirts in in time for Christmas. 
Uh, so for that Duncan and Bo come correct fan in your life, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you got, you got that and it, as well. All right. So, uh, you may be asking yourself, how do, how do I get one of these? Uh, you go to legionpodcast.com. There's a, a merch button there and there's, uh, some other Legion designs. Uh, there's, uh, the Grizzly poster design that I really like a lot. And, uh, as well as a couple of other things. And the, uh, of course, uh, the Duncan and Bo go to Lovecraft country shirt. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I said, 100% uh, cotton, available in bunches of sizes, a uh, bunch of colors. Uh, it's, uh, it's a real comfy shirt. It's really nice. They do good work. Yeah, yeah. treat yourself is what we are saying. And treat us. Treat. Yeah, well, it's, been, it's been a harsh year. Right? I don't know if anyone knows this, but this year has been harsh. And nothing will make you forget about that harsh year than the sweet, sweet 100% cotton feel of a Duncan and Bow. Go to Lovecraft Country. Yeah. Think, think how many opportunities you will have this holiday season to proudly wear this shirt uh, with your family members, and they can say to you, hey, who the fuck are Duncan and Bo? <laughs> and it's a it's a conversation starter, really. It, it really, really is. And I just want to be a fly in the wall as you try and explain who we are. <laughs> yeah, please. Please record without, that. I'll tell you what, Duncan. Without look, doing the voices, without doing any of Bo's voices, yeah. uh, without mentioning Twin Peaks, uh, or or Duncan being Scottish, or without me being Scottish, that that'll be really difficult. Um, <laughs> so yeah, if you can, if you can do that, then yeah, we'll, we'll throw in another T-shirt. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, Ten percent off the next one. How about that? Let's. See, that sounds good. Hey, sounds let's good. not just start yeah. giving shit away, Duncan. Well, yeah, Duncan. Duncan was going to sink the business, and Bo reined it back in. Jesus, see, this is teamwork. You can see which one of us comes from the socialist country, you fucking <laughs> Marxist motherfucker. Yeah, well, like in my t-shirts for I'd all. Be, uh, in my country, I'd be poor, Bo, um, but everyone would know who Duncan and Bo is. In That's, your country. Yes. You'd be rich, but only a select few would know. Kind of at least. That's how cults start. Um, no, uh, that's a bad thing either. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're preaching in the choir here, Duncan. I've been trying to start a cult for years. <laughs> I did wonder why you grew in the beard, and now it's making sense. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, with the robe, it's quite striking. It is. I, I can attest to that. It's, uh, I, it's, did, I did think when the call started, I was speaking to Jesus. I it's like, very Jesus, Mandy. That's really mad. Did you uh, going off in tangents like we do? Mm -hmm. Did you hear the album? Did I hear the album? What the fuck are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, so Jeremiah, the, well, the guy that plays Jeremiah, mm -hmm. um, did a concept album that came out a couple of weeks ago with multi multi instrumentalists, where it is a cult album based on that character. <laughs> no, how? Where can I get my hands on this? I will drop details to you um, after that. I don't have my phone on me. But if you type in his name, Jeremiah, whatever it was, um, into any like Spotify or whatever, you will get his full album. And I have listened to it, and it is as ludicrous and insane and awesome as you imagine. That sounds awesome. Uh, and I'll Just that you know, he's in full character as well. That's the best thing about it. He's in full fucking character for the whole album. So by the time you listen to this, ladies and gentlemen, go to legionpodcast.com, click on the Buy Legion stuff. We will have the album available there too. No, that's <laughs> it, just the shirts. Oh, also we got some phone covers and tote bags. So, uh, you know, just uh, treat yourself. Um, treat yourself. <laughs> I love hawk. I love hawking merchandise now. I feel like it's really starting to speak to me. I can start to see. I, I'm starting to see why so many podcasts spend the first ten minutes just advertising. It's kind of fun. I don't know how <laughs> it is for the listener, but for us, we're having a blast. But let's. <laughs> but you're right. Let's move on to the show proper, mm -hmm. uh, and we begin as ever, Duncan, with Ooh. a quick discussion. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I, I love how surprised you were. Uh, <laughs> oh well, <laughs> the start of the show, you say. Um, <laughs> questions you ask yeah, um, <laughs> yeah well, i i know you don't listen duncan but at the beginning of the show we talk about a couple of movies one good do, one bad that, yeah and mm -hmm. uh and i'm curious because i got a real stinkeroo this week duncan <laughs> i'm coming heavy on the bad so uh but I'm, I'm curious give me one of yours good or bad uh hit me with your best shot fire away duncan Hey, so I did a, I did a kind of, I've started doing, well, like very similar to yourself, I have a cash channel and people can jump in. I usually do it on Thursday nights in the UK and we've 
just finished doing True Detective season one, like the whole season. So that's my good revisiting that um, and kind of two episodes a week, sort of like chunks reminded me. And I think like time is only ever going to be kind to that show, which was already, you know, very well received, mm. uh, even on the rewatch. Like that's my fourth watch through now uh, since I aired what six years ago. Um, and it, it just gets better. It just gets better and better every time I watch it. And what was really interesting about it is, I, and kind of linking back into what we're doing on this show, is, like, I remember a lot of the things coming out. Is it horror? Isn't it horror? Well, they're mentioning a bit about Lovecraft. I didn't know to what extent Lovecraft is actually referenced in, in True Detective Season 1, because I've not read a lot of Lovecraft, if I'm honest. And um, kind of post doing that show and just being in the right mood and wanting some audiobooks, uh, I found like a couple of websites that, that essentially make reference to all the stuff he is making reference to. And it is a lot. <laughs> like, that could have been Lovecraft Country. <laughs> like, <laughs> Bite your tongue, so, sir. Yeah, if, they, if they want to do a crossover, um, both HBO, so that's fine. Um, if they want to do a crossover where I don't know the next season there's a time machine that brings Russ and Cole back and he starts talking about time being a flat circle, I am in Right and Hippolyta is like, no, a lot of people think it's a flat circle. Yep. But yeah. it's it happens all the time. He's like, no, yeah, if, he'd, no. if he'd appeared if he'd appeared if he had appeared in one of those multiverse sequences, Bo, like all bets are off. That's all I'm gonna say. All bets could have been off. That's my good it was you know, it really was jaw-droppingly good going back through it and i'm going to be doing in january i'm doing season two for the people that are are following on with me and me and you are relatively in the minority on our overall feelings on season two which i thought was, it was really good i just didn't think it was on the same level as season one it, but yeah really, it's messy really but it's good yeah yeah I'm really hopeful on that second view and I get much more out of it again because I think there's, like, we obviously at the time mentioned a lot to do with kind of film noir um, but also a lot of lynching references. I hope that when I go back through it, I pick up a lot more on it. So that's my good, my bad, um, which isn't even really all that bad, but I, I kind of feel like I have to to uh, make mention of it um, because that's how we do this. <laughs> Here. I don't know if the people know about this. Um, and it's not bad. It's actually surprisingly fun, but I didn't realise it was just schlocky. So let me uh, let me pivot this by saying this scores relatively high on the podcast under the stairs scoring style, which is based on feelings as opposed to technical ability. Um, but on a technical ability, it's a very sloppy, very messy movie. Uh, it's the Christmas horror movie, Dead End. Uh, starring Ray Wise and Lin Shi. Um Great movie. I mean, like in terms of weirdly kind of almost like a Twilight Zone episode formed it into a movie and all the rest. I love those aspects about it. I love the performances. I think Lin Shi is it's maybe my favourite performance of her in anything. Um, there's a bit where she goes off a rocker and she's fucking borderline hilarious, but Ray Wise is incredible. But it's a messy fucking movie. It's a really, really messy movie that plays with, um, like there's a the the kind of the son character in it is like a complete dickhead, and he's the you know he's the kid that's a skateboarder who listens all these horrible stereotypes that I hate from the early two thousands, and he only listens to alternative rock, and some of his actions in it are a bit cringy looking back, and then there's a whole bit where Rewise just beats the shit out of his daughter and that's super cringy as well and i mean it's kind of they kind of justify it at the end but um i always remember that movie being a lot tighter than it actually is and whilst it's still a ton of fun to watch and trust me if you've never seen it before watch it over christmas because you, you know some of the performances like rewise and lynchy in particular the reason you want to watch that movie but the way it's constructed together it's it's pretty fucking sloppy it's a it's a sloppy Joe of a movie. Um, so now yeah, I'm that's hungry. my I, yeah. I'm, I I haven't really watched anything bad since we last spoke, and that's the best I can do. And it's a movie that I really like. So um, what about yourself? You said you had one really bad. Yeah, li- um, I'm, I'm. Do not... you like Dead End? By the way, have you seen it? I I have not seen Dead End. You need to watch it. Ray Wise is a delight in it. All right, I will. I will give that a look because I do enjoy the Ray Wise, as you know. Mm-hmm. And Lynchy legitimately is. There's a bit I know 
that if we ever did a commentary on it, I know there's a whole middle section where we'd, we'd be doing a lot of giggling because uh, she really does. She can, <laughs> she can, <laughs> she kind of like embraces that our character has a mental breakdown in the middle, and um, she she steers right into it as a character, and it's fucking incredible. Um, so yeah, it, so you should check it out. So hit me with your two. Come on, bring it on. All right, uh, don't get so bossy. First of all, uh, let me go with the good one. Ooh. And and I feel this is... A, I'm Uh-oh. still processing my emotions on on this movie Uh-oh. a little bit. But it's the uh, the new uh, Chris Landon movie, Freaky. Oh, yeah. So that's... Um, I'm hopefully watching that tomorrow. So I'm very excited. Okay. So I'm obviously I don't want to be spoilery at all about this. Mm-hmm. Here's what well, I... It's, it's, it's Freaky Friday, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, exactly. That's why it's called Freaky. It's Freaky Friday yeah. only... Uh, Vince Vaughn is a serial killer called the butcher mm-hmm. and he, uh, it has come into possession of a like sacred Incan knife <laughs> that, uh, he, he ends up stabbing this high school girl with intending to sacrifice her. Mm-hmm. But what happens is she doesn't die and they swap bodies. Mm-hmm. Hey, and, when that happens. <laughs> and so now you have. Uh, a, a serial killer in a, a savage monstrous serial killer in the body of a high school girl mm-hmm. and vice versa and yeah, right. uh, so very fun premise uh, good performances in, in many of the same ways that uh, Chris Landon acquits himself well with something like Happy Death Day yeah you know yeah. where I'm a big fan of both those movies as well I, so I am as well. And mm-hmm. so going into this, I was really excited. And maybe that was <laughs> may, and maybe that was to the detriment of the film. Mm-hmm. Um, my big takeaway was that was really fun. It's interesting to see Chris Landon do another spin on a slasher movie. Because mm-hmm. it was like the first time it was like, well, what if you uh, like married Groundhog Day in a slasher movie? Yeah, Grant Hogsley. Right. And this yeah. is, what if you took a, a slasher movie and married it with Freaky Friday? And yeah. and which isn't bad, and it's a lot of fun, and there are good performances, and I had a good time. Mm-hmm. I want Chris Landon to do a completely different film next time. Like, yeah. I, I just, I, the, the biggest problem I had with the movie is that it felt not exactly predictable, but expected. Yeah. And but that said, it's got some great kills. Uh Vince Vaughn has some really nice moments. He doesn't overplay the character, which is nice. Like he's not cartoonish. Mm-hmm. But there's a great scene with uh with him and the boy that this girl has a crush on. Mm-hmm. And it's a very like sweet scene that's also very funny. And yeah. and that stuff is really good. Like like it's I almost feel like I'm damning it with faint praise. And I don't mean that. <laughs> it's a good movie, and and it was a lot of fun. Um, but it it felt like it was hitting a lot of those same notes that Happy Death Day did, which is like, oh yeah, okay. So the character, uh, in this case, isn't kind of the bitchy character that Tree was, who becomes like realize like Happy Death Day is all about her realizing what a terrible person she's been and how how she can relate to those around her better and stuff like that. And, mm-hmm. and this is, you know, of that stripe of like, okay, well, the, you know, this is a girl there, the family has had some tragedy recently. And so everybody in the family is kind of working through that. And, and so there's a nice, uh, kind of subtext to everything that's going on in the movie. Um, again, it all feels really competent and, and really good. Mm-hmm. Um, it just. I I I just want to see Chris Landon do something completely unexpected next, next time. I just don't want him to fall into this trap of like his next movie is a slasher movie combined with she's all that, you know, yeah. or something like that. It's just enough already. I get it. You understand slasher movies and you understand them well enough to put them in a different genre and it still mm. works. But got it. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> so, so but it was fun you should you should see it and i think you'll have a good time with it 
Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Like I say, love love those first two Happy Death Day movies. Yeah. Really hope we get that third one. I, I, I generally, because the more little tidbits I hear about that, the more my appetite is completely, you know, ready to consume. Um, like, just, it, it sounds grand in scope. So I'm kind of hoping this movie does enough business so uh, Jason Blum, who's not short a penny, will actually invest in... I mean, there's a reason you have all the movies that do incredible money elsewhere, and that is to afford you the opportunity to do movies that you want to see. And he keeps talking about how much he wants to see Happy Death Day, th- uh, Happy Death Day 3. Well, Jason, you're the man with the pushing. <laughs> right. It's... You can make that happen. Yeah. Like, so if you want it to happen, it will fucking happen. It's not about audience or anything like that. If you want it to happen... It will happen, so put your money where your mouth is. And Yeah, and I think ultimately maybe that's my biggest takeaway from Freaky is that it feels very safe. Yeah. You know, it feels like a movie meant to be a mainstream, crowd-pleasing movie. And Which is maybe he's thought, you know, I, I put what, it's maybe that um, Guillermo del Toro approach. I do a movie which ticks all those boxes and all the rest, so when I want to do my movie <laughs> on the side, you know, people are like, yeah, we'll give him it. So I yeah. hope... We do. I know they're talking about crossovers between Freaky and Happy. I'm not, I've not seen the movie yet, but I don't want that. I just want you to finish. You have a story, you have a third part written, give me that third part, and then like Bo says, go off and do something else. Yeah, so. and and I really like Happy Death Day to you uh, mm-hmm. quite a bit. Yeah. And and so, yes, I like. I know Chris Landon is capable of getting weird and inventive. Yeah. And, and I, that's more of what I want to see out of him. Is the yeah, there's not there's been. there's too many directors going the other way. You know what right. I mean? Right, right. Like, so, there, yeah, plenty of people could have made Freaky. Yeah, I, I feel. Um, maybe not everyone could have written Freaky, but anybody could have made it. And yeah. and and yeah, I want to see the movie that only Christopher Landon is, is capable of. So, because uh, I think he's real talented. That's you know, I'm not angry. I'm disappointed, Duncan. He's yeah, he's a good boy, <laughs> and I want to see him do well. <laughs> So, <laughs> you're promising me something really bad this week. So bring I, on your really bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So this is one that uh, got batted around a little bit uh, in in our Discord channel, and oh, right. and it was brought to me by Jason Gray, who it will always watch the shittiest stuff, and every now and mm-hmm. again he'll be like, "This is fucking terrible." Enough so that it, like, pings my radar, and I'm like, all right, well, let me see. Like, I want to see how bad this really is. Uh, The movie, Duncan, is called Factory of Paranormal. No? Yeah, I've never heard of this before. No, of course not. Um, Yeah, but I'm not surprised that you watched it, though, with the word paranormal in it. All right, but I'll tell you, here's another, like, this will suck our bow in in a second kind of thing. Um, It's a found footage... (laughs) Hey, we're investigating this uh, penitentiary kind of thing, <laughs> and and uh, like I'm a sucker for those because if you do those right, that can still be effective. Like I can still get fooled by something like that if mm-hmm. if you do it right. And um, <laughs> this movie, holy shit, Duncan! They never really go inside. It's just a lot of like we're going around the fence, <laughs> and it's two girls. Like the whole thing feels like it cost about four seventy five. There's uh there's a whole to do for a while about this cloak blowing around and they're just like, Holy shit, where did that come from? And you're like, Oh boy, this is this is bad. But Duncan, just when you think like, well, this cheap piece of shit can't get any worse, the last like twenty minutes where it's like, Oh, here's who the killer was and I guess there's something supernatural about this cloak that blows around. It is, there are a number of flashbacks to Mm -hmm. shit you just saw, because the whole movie is about 82 minutes, or not even, (laughs) it's probably one of, I think it was like 72, I think it's like the legal length, (laughs) you know, (laughs) right, and and so they do a bunch of flashbacks to pad out the runtime of stuff that you just saw like five minutes ago, (laughs) but (laughs) it's... But also, it's not edited well either. So sometimes it's moving between flashbacks and then the present and then to another flashback. But this one is later. And then another flashback will happen on top of that that's earlier. 
And it's just like somebody threw the last 20 minutes of the movie into a blender and then just put it all together. Oh, man. I mean, like, it's one of those things, and I know this isn't you, and I would never recommend that you ever, ever watch this movie. Mm -hmm. But for bad movie connoisseurs like myself, it's one of those, like, true gems of, like, holy shit, nobody involved with this knew anything about making a movie. (laughs) <laughs> this was all a lot of guesswork and and they guessed wrong duncan they guessed wrong they <laughs> there's a lot of like shitty day for night shooting with like handheld cameras and it's oh, just a travesty God. it's a like the thing shouldn't even be called a movie and yet somehow but the like by the basis definition it is um so it it got me excited because there are very few opportunities to see something this terrible. <laughs> um, so if if that is your thing, ladies and gentlemen, if you if you love a bad like a head scratchingly bad movie, like who on earth ever submitted this to the good people at Amazon Prime and said, "No, no, trust us, this is really a movie," mm-hmm. and Amazon believed them. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> there is no quality control happening at that that streaming service at all. Uh, Amazon more like was it seventy one minutes or above? It is check you're in <laughs> right. How how much server space is it? Two point yeah. seven gigs. Yeah, all right. Maybe we can squeeze that one in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we got a server that we keep the Sopranos on. <laughs> it's got like eight gigs on it left, and we were just gonna put nothing on there. But what? It, what's a factory of paranormal? All right, um, <laughs> go ahead, Larry. Put it on the Soprano server. Yeah, even the name doesn't really make sense. No, because again, Duncan, they don't go inside. <laughs> but even if they didn't, factory of paranormal, right? What, is, what does that like? We're missing the the right you know, are, factory of the paranormal. Are, is paranormal stuff happening inside the factory? Are they yeah. making paranormal stuff at this yeah. factory? Is, All... the, is the place that is situated paranormal? Because that's what it sounds like. Yeah. This is the factory of paranormal. Did you not know that? Is it, yeah, is it just like paranormal Utah? Like, no, that's just the factory of paranormal Utah. It's it's the one we got. <laughs> I don't know. All fine questions, Duncan, and there are no answers. No answers. No answers. Oh, well, <clears throat> I think you've... Uh, you maybe set the bar very low. No. <laughs> yeah, it w- but it, it was fun to watch it because it really was like it never failed to entertain. Mm. And and the I mean the acting's just irritating as all hell. And oh, it's it's just the worst. Uh, but Duncan, I'll tell you what's not yes. the worst. Oh, and that's uh, Lovecraft Country. No, some would argue it's the best. <laughs> it's pretty fucking good, Duncan. Um. <laughs> So let's, uh, I'll tell you what, before we get into that, let's do questions. Uh, you are like, you are like determined to stretch this into it and I bless your cotton salts for it. No, 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 no. I, we asked for questions. We got some questions. It only Did we get hard. some questions? We, yes, Duncan. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I thought you were just like, like, I don't know. Maybe you put out for questions. No one asked questions. So then, you know, like Ro Bansdale sent, sent in a question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? Yes. This coming in from Blow Blansdale. <laughs> no. All right. So Ian uh, asks us, will there be a visit from the French guy with the foot? <laughs> I don't know what's worse about that sentence is the fact that it came out on that recording. It was a podcast under the stairs, recent E24. Uh, episode that me, Bo, and Jamie, uh, Jamie Salmons did, and that's that's it. That was Jamie's clue to who she originally then said was Jenna Depardieu. Yeah. Um, I don't know what was worse is the fact that I deciphered the madness really, really quickly and worked out that it was Daniel Day Lewis <laughs> from the French guy with the foot. <laughs> I all yes. It, it, Right, it's it's ridiculous, but also I like the idea that uh, Gerard Depardieu once played a guy without a foot, <laughs> called like you know, Monsieur Sans Le Bas. 
<laughs> Gerard Jeppardieu in, um, in Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how did he not play Captain Hook? It's a, it's a travesty against cinema. Now that, that I, he's never done that. He would have been perfect. He's, I mean, he's already pretty much... He's already bloated and red faced from alcohol. Right. And I <laughs> he, think he could be a pilot. <laughs> I think diabetes has already taken one of his feet. <laughs> so he's already got the peg leg. Diabetes are gout, one of the two. Right. <laughs> I lost this foot to gout. <laughs> Mon Dieu. Uh, so... uh, what can I say? I have most feet. Well, if you ever want to do uh, an impression of a French person, all you have to do is think, how would a vet include do this sentence and then just copy it? Sure. A <laughs> two drinks of cognac? One of, the, one of the more convincing French accents in cinema. <laughs> oh, which, what once is again, this? Is, <laughs> to the big reveal in that movie is that she's that she's putting on the voice, which makes sense. <laughs> um. <'Cause>, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Rayman got, uh, has two questions for us. Bring it on, oh, Ram Man. All right, uh, the first one is is a real uh, serious question, Duncan. Oh, I, oh, we're we're high on life and jokes right now. I know. Will twenty twenty one? He asks, be more of the same of what we're experiencing in twenty twenty. I will say no, and there are a couple of reasons behind that. I think some lessons have been learned in 2020 mm -hmm. that will not be repeated in 2021. I think the fact that there is, if we're, if we're speaking it from a, a COVID position, um, some real good news on that that vaccine. Um, so I think it will it will take time to build up confidence, kind of post, like, general release of a vaccine for people to get back to normal. I think certain things can't go back to normal, um, and we just have to recognise that the world has changed in the last year uh, in a way where people have relied much more on uh, even things like internet shopping. People have kind of tightened the belts when it comes to eating at restaurants or just generally how we acclimate to, to kind of socializing in general. I think a lot of that will change and will come back slowly, but will never be the way it was before. Can't imagine it um, because there are people that will genuinely be I almost think forever cautious now, moving forward. Um, I think those that are hyperventilating right now about the whole Warner Brothers uh, HBO Max thing, uh, to pivot into our our world and our interests as cinephiles, uh, that are hyperventilating that cinemas are going to disappear. Cinemas will not disappear. I can't st I'd stress this earlier on in the year when all the cinemas closed. Uh, they won't disappear. As long as there are people who want to, the cinematic experience cinemas will exist. Will they be as large as they were before? Maybe not. Will they be as full as they were at their, you know, largest? Probably not. Um, but I think this has forced some decisions that were ultimately always going to happen and just brought them forward a little. Um, like, there should be no reason in 2020 with the technology that people have and the way we consume media that you can't choose to sit at home and watch a movie which you'd be playing at the theatre at home on your own home theatre. Um, and that's just a fact. That's just the way it is. Uh, that's how it should be, I would argue. Um, and that allows, if anything, that allows greater choice, which if I'm releasing a movie, that's kind of... What I want, the only thing they need to be able to do is stop those movies being pirated. But to be honest with you, those movies that play at the cinema anyway get pirated anyway. So I, I don't know if you'll ever be able to stop that fully. But yeah, I'm, I'm, the, 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 there's a whole sea of hyperventilating people out there about you know this is well Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers have done it. Disney's going to do it. This is the end of this is the end of cinema. I read a really interesting thing where a guy, um, a guy who works very high up in Arrow films, had basically put forward that you know yeah some of these bigger films may play it you know at home, but it allows the opportunity for these indie movies that don't get much of a shout at the cinema to maybe get a shout at the cinema. Maybe the next time, uh, you know, a Star Wars movie or a you know Marvel movie comes out, it doesn't take up more than half the screens at a cinema. Maybe it only takes up two. And you know what? That means the rest of those screens can be other movies, which would be refreshing. 
the amount of times I've had to travel very far to see a, a film that I want to see because whatever big blockbuster has been released has squeezed it out of the town that I live in is, you know, isn't great. Maybe these things change it. Maybe it gives people more choice, which is ultimately what it should be doing. The film industry is the last one to really let the penny drop on that one, specifically on new titles, is the last one to kind of, like, the music industry's already went that way. Streaming movies in general for rentals or on Netflix or whatever has went that way. Uh, it's a proven market space, so if that's the way cinema's going to go, where you have an option, I can't see that as being a bad thing. I think that's a good thing, and I think as consumers, that's a good thing. So, on that level, this. And then, just, like, on the wider situation i think without going too political i think america will stabilize a bit next year not fully i think there's damage that will take a generation to solve um and you're just gonna have to deal with that but i think your footing on the world stage will be a bit better um and yeah maybe maybe in time the discourse quietens down a little bit so yeah if, i don't think it's going to be nearly as bad as it was this year i think it will be better I don't think it's going to be the return to the norm that a lot of people say it's going to be. I think you need to kind of set your expectations to a realistic, pragmatic approach. And yeah, listen, the world is what you make it. If you are optimistic, forward think, forward looking, forward thinking, and positive, good things will happen. If you dwell in in negativity, um, you become a magnet to it. So all I can say is, um, without going to Jerry Springer at the end here with my final thoughts, um, embrace a bit, of, a bit of love in your heart and put your best foot forward and treat people the way that you would want to be treated yourself. And I think you'll find that things will work themselves out. That's very nice, Duncan. Um, well, but you didn't expect that from a cynical Scott. <laughs> and you're piping smoking, Bo. I, I tend to agree with almost all of that. I, I think that uh, 2020 has been a rough year for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. All of those reasons are going to improve at least slightly yeah. in the coming year. Like, I think 2021, I don't think it's going to be easy. Like, no, like, look, life ain't easy. Like, you know, <laughs> life takes some effort. And, uh, uh, and that will continue. Like 2021 is still going to be challenging. Mm -hmm. The vaccine is going to take a while to get to everyone. We're going to here in the States in particular, we're going to have to endure a bunch of nonsense backlash over people implanting computer chips in your bodies because of the vaccine. Oh, that sort of, that sort of shit's like happened. That. Yeah. People are moaning about over here. It's been green lit in the UK. So, um, first country in the world to green light it. And um, the government over here, the main government, said that it's only because of Brexit that that's happened. Because uh, every other, every really? other, every other country in the world, Bo, is in the European Union. If you didn't know, oh, fucking sure. morons, absolute fucking morons. But yeah, so at least in America, you will have the safety of knowing that if anything does go wrong with the vaccine, you can view it from afar first. <laughs> right. Before you take it. <laughs> See if anybody just melts into a fleshy bottle in the yeah, streets if I appear on, a, if I appear on a, a, a call soon and I've got three heads um, and seven cocks then you'll know that I don't know maybe you want to take it I don't know uh, I mean it's <laughs> makes me wish I had it'll, seven heads it'll, oh, yeah <laughs> uh, you're such a child I love it uh, so I yes I think all that is right especially about the dicks um, I <laughs> I also think that, uh, as you said, I think the temperature is going to lower on just kind yeah. of political rhetoric and all that stuff. And I'm, I'm glad for that, uh, for sure. Um, mm. you know, we're just not going to have a president that wants to make the white house a, a circus and, mm -hmm. and instead somebody that's just going to be doing boring president shit and nobody's going to care after about <laughs> six months, like people are going to be like, Oh, right. I don't. I don't have to worry about what the fuck the president is doing every day. Um, yeah. And, and so that'll be nice for us as a, as a nation. Um, so yeah, he just, I think... needs, he just needs to remember that he is, his body is like Samuel L. Jackson and unbreakable at the moment. I mean, he broke his foot walking his dog. Like, like if, if you could just like maybe stop him doing shit like that and just have him sit down a lot, I think that might, that might benefit things in the long run. <laughs> 
I uh, the best joke I heard about that is uh, <laughs> after he broke his foot, Kamala Harris sent uh, a, a whole bunch of cupcakes to the Biden household with a note. <laughs> for uh, the dog that says there's more when you finish the job <laughs> it's funny it's funny we have a little good we can have some fun with old man biden now that he won <laughs> have a good time with the old grandpa president um he's but he's he's a good grandpa president he's not like mm. super racist grandpa president he's like you know he it, like he's the, the one who still wants to be cool like hey, hey i'm still young <laughs> and you're like, no, you're not grandpa president. He's like, all right, come back here, you son of a bitch. I'll punch you in the face. I was in Korea. <laughs> you're like, I get it, grandpa president. But hey, I'm glad you're here. I love you to death. But I just can't listen to these Korea stories anymore. <laughs> I know a guy. His name was Stinky Willie. You ran into I don't know a Stinky Willie story. <laughs> ran, used, to, used to lifeguard with him. Back, back when all the women had to wear clothes that went from their ankles up above their eyebrows to swim. So you didn't see anything you weren't supposed to. You know what oh. I'm saying, Billy? <laughs> I'm talking about their vaginas. Anyway, anyway, sorry. But yes, so I think that all of that will be better. Mm. Um. And and let's do a final question, uh, also from the Ram Man. This, or this is less a question than a, what are our thoughts on this thing? Oh, right. Go for it. And uh, that is the Predator movie, now in development, with uh, Clover, 10 Cloverfield Lane, Dan Trachtenberg, uh, the director of 10 Cloverfield Lane, um, now in the director's chair of that. Do you want to take first stab at it? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I saw that last Predator movie, and I thought that was really stinky. Um, <laughs> I thought the one before that with Adrian Brody was all right, though. The one with Lawrence Fishburne and whatnot. On the the Predator Robert plane. Rodriguez one. Yeah, I thought that one yeah. was fine. I thought that uh, had a lot of energy and was just a, a kind of a fun action movie. And that's all I'm looking for of a Predator movie. Um, you know, Predator has never been really, there are like some horror trappings and, and some sci-fi trappings, obviously, but at the end of the day, it's just about like this big monster, what kills people. And then, you know, our heroes have to stop it. You know, that's it. Mm -hmm. That is every Predator movie. And I, that's fine. Like it just, it, it requires somebody willing to find the right tone for a movie like this. I thought that, uh. That was the big problem with the Predator, the Shane Black one. I, I felt like the tone of that was it was muddled. It yeah. was yeah, it was just very muddled, wildly inconsistent, and I didn't know like is this supposed to be goofy? But then this got real serious, but now it's stupid again, and I don't understand how I'm supposed to feel about any of it. Yeah, when that movie finished, and you get the kind of the reveal at the very end of the organization in the background, and what was going to come out of that. That was a bit where I was like, "That see if you just had that tone all the way through the movie, I would have been in, you know, because that's what that's what I want—the big government conspiracy in the background, linking back to Predator Two, and the, like all that stuff. That and it, there's a specific goofiness about that that I'm like, "Yep, I can handle that." Or go the complete other way, go 100% straight, play it straight, and I the the mixture of the two was very confusing. Um, the the problem with the Predator movies in general, post Predator, <laughs> post yeah Predator Two, uh -huh. is that they became all about the Predator and not about the survival. Um, and that oh, our Predators now have ten new gadgets. So like James Bond, oh, they've got ten new gadgets, and um, there's like seventeen different kinds now, and some of them are absolutely massive and so like, and it became all about them and the cool gadgets they have and the, the the multitude of ways they have to kill you and less about the characters actually trying to survive. It's why the Robert Rodriguez film worked like better than it probably should have was because that movie ground things back into it, right? It took it away from Earth, which I actually think made sense because you're nulling questions like, well, mobile phones, technology, all that stuff, you null all that straight out and then you you put it on a different planet and then we don't have those questions anymore and we can, we can get on with it. Um, and also the idea of picking different people from different parts of the world, different like skill levels of, of prey from felt 
felt interesting. But to me, the movie should always be grounded in the idea of there's something coming to get us and we need to stop it. And the more complicated you make that or the more ridiculous the challenge becomes, like I can believe at the end of Predator that Arnie bested that Predator, right? And every other movie since then, I can't believe those people have bested that Predator with all its fucking gadgets, its spaceship, its 10 brothers. It's, you know, it, it, it becomes ludicrous. There's something about that very first movie which knew exactly what it was dealing with. Um, it was aided by the fact that Arnie is like a fucking chiseled Adonis as well, which helps. Sure. Um, yeah, but, but when it got down to brass tacks, it was a giant fucking alien without weapons fighting Arnold Schwarzenegger who looked like you could literally drop a building on him and he'd walk out just like brushing off some dust. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's how those movies operate. I think they've needlessly complicated it afterwards because what what sells off the back of that is all the Predator merch. Um, it's very similar to any franchise in horror as well. That's how they go. Um, you know, they go more ridiculous and more... What they need to do... Like The Predator movie is basically a Friday the 13th movie. Uh, just set in the jungle. Yeah, um, the, that, yeah. That's kind right. of what they need to just stick with. Is that make as the reason most of those Friday the Thirteen sequels work well is because they don't fuck with the formula. The formula is simple. You can bring a, a multitude of different people into any scenario where that thing is, and just replay that again. The Ten Cloverfield Lane director, I thought Ten Cloverfield Lane was a great movie. Mm. Uh, I really, really, really did. And when you hear about how it was one movie to begin with and then they tagged on some stuff, that stuff they tagged on the end worked really well for me um, and added, a, a, once again, this kind of Twilight Zone sort of element on it, which I really enjoyed. So, yeah, he's getting that movie. I'll be interested to see it as long as we get to see his movie. Um, am I not correct in saying that Disney will be behind this? Because uh, it's a yeah, Fox property. Right, so, yeah, so this would be Disney, yeah. Yeah, so all I'm going to say is like that that sheen that everyone used to have when Disney acquired something is kind of gone for me. Like, I don't think they've really massively delivered something that I think has been a vast improvement over what properties were like pre Disney for quite some time. Um, so, you know, I go in skeptical of that. They're a studio that will micromanage absolutely everything. So, what you get at the end will be passed through a massive series of checklists and producers. And at the end of the day, Disney will not release anything that even remotely um, impacts the image that they have as a large, mass, mass media outlet, which is built and predicated on children's entertainment. So, yeah, be, be wary is all I'm saying. I don't think you're getting a fucking R-rated Predator movie. I think realistically, uh, it's going to be something uh, in line for what the PG thirteen or something is probably what it's going to be, and I don't think it's going to be nearly as dark. I know it sounds like I'm being cynical, but I have to approach all these things that way when these sort of studios are kind of named against them now. the 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 free world now is your Netflix and your Amazon. That's where the really interesting shit's happening. Um, like this week we got Mank, which I've started to watch. Me and you'll be doing it for next year's Opera Omnia. Um, but it's Fincher, and Fincher is like very chatty just now about the massive deal that he signed with Netflix, which to me makes me very excited because Fincher, really interesting di- director, and Netflix don't meddle. Yeah, they've given them all a shitload of money to do whatever the fuck he wants. If you're not excited about that, I'm far more excited about that than I am about seeing what we can do with the Predator franchise. You know what I mean? (laughs) Well, like like when uh, Netflix, uh, you know, recently did The Irishman with Scorsese. Oh, yeah. And before that, they had, what, Roma with uh, Coran. Yeah. And, like, Netflix is willing to be a bastion for that kind of all-tour director that's like, hey, I want to spend, like, $40 million on something fucking weird. Yeah, like, like... Dare I say the recent news that they have David Lynch in to do an entire television series next year? Yeah, I mean that. Like, literally, I feel like they've been listening to our conversations because I'm fairly sure at the end of the Turn Beats conversation we were like, you know what, Netflix just needs to give David Lynch money or David Cronenberg money and say, go make something. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I can't remember. It sounds bizarre. Whatever the working name was. 
like I can't remember. It's like a, a weird diverse or something like that. I was like, yeah, that'll do me. <laughs> I found Netflix on my clicker. What's really funny is like I just always go back to the, the the David Lynch, you know, like watching a movie on your fucking phone, like, like getting really angry about it. And you know, Netflix isn't cinema. <laughs> So, right, no, but but they'll he's put, rolling with the punches on it, which is a smart fucking move. You know, like, also they'll you, they'll pull a Roma where they're like, "Hey, we're gonna throw it in a few movie." Th- like, if somebody wants to go out and experience, oh this, god, yeah, yeah, it's gonna go somewhere. And I'll tell you right now, it, it'll go right into my eyeballs when it's made, and right into my Blu-ray collection when it's released. So, well, and plus, it's a, if it's a TV show, technically. Yes. Lynch still has not made a movie for fucking phones. <laughs> so, you know, he's still pure of heart. He's still pure. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, yeah, so go, I, go I don't on. know. I don't know. I like I see the, the whole predator thing. I, I want I want to be more excited than I am. But I'm it's the Disney thing that's got me. To be honest, the Fox thing was an issue as well. So I just don't think directors in the current system of those massive studios get much of a chance to do the movies they want, unless they already command a huge... Like, James Wan's got that movie, apparently going straight straight to HBO Max through Warner Brothers, which is a giallo, um, coming out next year. And he's done that because he's James fucking Wan and has made all the money. Um and that's why he wanted to he wanted to make that movie. So they have done that, and he will do for for whoever is that is asking Aquaman too. So and that to me is that trade off I'm talking about. He will do that movie for them that will make all the money, and for them it costs them fucking nothing to give him thirty million to make a a Jalo, which they don't care about. <laughs> so like, sure, you know what I mean, it's it's, yeah. it's the perfect setup. And in that in that environment, yeah, this dude he's made that movie that appeared on Netflix because no one would release it. Um and no, oh, no, that one was in the cinema. I did see it in the cinema. Um so yeah, I'm being inter- I'm I'm yeah, I'm I'm curious, but like I say, if it's just another excuse to have like oh, look at the brand new predator helmet design, couldn't give a fuck. Like could not give less of a fuck about that one. He's what gonna- I want is like, what were you going to say? I'd say he's going to show up on the Mandalorian. Yeah. <laughs> like, we've never seen underneath your helmet. Yeah. Like, you are one. Okay, motherfucker. <laughs> Go on, put that back on. Um, this is yeah. the way. <laughs> I, yeah, want some candy. Uh, I'm just, I'm like, like I say, I don't, I, I genuinely, uh, I just don't get excited about that sort of thing as much as i probably used to um in favor of like like you say the weird news where you hear like oh lynch is doing this yeah i mean the fincher news for me is music to my ears i couldn't be any more excited about that one because he is genuinely one of those directors where it's been far too long since he made a movie and he's finally putting out the movie he wanted and reviews have been fairly great across the board thus far um and, you know, he signed this deal and he's going to be doing a ton of things. It's the Flanagan thing as well. Flanagan's got all that Netflix money to do whatever the fuck he wants. And I, I say to Flanagan, you keep taking that Netflix money and do whatever the fuck you want. You yeah, know what no, I mean? You, as, you ride that Netflix train till they just stop. Because yeah, like, no, I, no. I wasn't I wasn't crazy about uh, Bly Manor, but... I've not watched it yet, so... But then, like, we spoke about this before. The stuff that I have read about it are, like, it's... He's doing the, the turn of the screw, which is really dry. <laughs> like, it's a really fucking dry subject matter. Anyway, the story's been done to death, and it's never really been done great. So I'm interested to see what it looks like. And it's Mike Flanagan, so he has he has my eyes on it anyway. And if it's not great, eh, it's fine. Yeah, you know I mean, I, I don't I don't care because he's got what he's got a, another two King projects in the works just now and whatever the fuck else he's going to be doing. and Yeah, it's an exciting thing. Alex, Alex uh, Garland, the, the dude behind Ex Machina, mm-hmm. and um, what's the name of that movie? The other one he did, which I loved. Uh, Annihilation. Annihilation. He's made a low-budget horror movie, which is yeah. coming out, and I'm like, fuck, give me that. Ben Wheatley's got a low-budget horror movie coming out, which he's done in COVID. Uh, so, I mean, like that's more exciting to me, like I say, than the... You know, Disney's doing a. I don't want to sound like a Disney hater, but Disney's doing a Predator movie. 
Um, I'm more excited about the low-budget film done by the really interesting director who knew that he was trapped and couldn't do anything during COVID, so wrote a really quick, gnarly script and is bringing it directly to, you know, that's exciting. Um, so uh, we time will play out. Maybe, maybe the movie comes out, Bo, and we sit on a recording going, did you see that new Predator movie? It was fucking kick-ass. Nothing would make me happier than sure, I to be the guy so. that, that says that, but I just, I've got... Yeah, no, it'd be great mm. if it comes out and it's R-rated and hyper-violent and cool yeah. and fun and all that stuff. And and we can, like, I'll be happy to say, uh, right along with you, like, yeah. oh, yeah, no, Disney showed some balls. They put out a movie that had some real spine. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> but... but, but <laughs> And to kind of circle back to the HBO Max thing uh, just for a second, because that's how I pronounce it, HBO Max. Um, HBO Max, which is not available in the UK yet. I'll, I'll tell you, I think it's a pretty good service. You know, certainly this new announcement sweetens the pot, mm-hmm. uh, but they also have the old Looney Tunes, and I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> but the, the thing about that, first of all, those movies sitting on a shelf are, are yeah. doing nobody any good. Yeah, that is literally at the moment all those movies are completed and ready to go. Yeah. So it's it's not, it's not as if it's like they're saying, well, we're only making movies now from this point onwards purely to be released in streaming as well as cinema. What they're basically saying is rather than them play to a series of empty cinemas because you, as a cautious person, don't want to leave the house, we're going to give you that option as a consumer to watch it from home. I, I don't see how that makes them the bad guy. <laughs> yeah, and especially, you know, like the terms aren't that liberal. I mean, they're like, hey, we're going to, like with the Wonder Woman, it's, yeah. <laughs> that's the name of it, the Wonder Woman. The Wonder Woman. Yeah, yeah. Wonder Woman 84, <laughs> uh, that they're dropping it Christmas Day and opening it in theaters the same day. Mm-hmm. And it's available on the service for a month and then it goes away for a while. So yeah. that... You know, uh, they can release it on Amazon and Apple and all that stuff and make their bones there with it. So, yeah, it's it's one of those things that, like, you, as we've been talking about, you've got it on the shelf. Why not drop it to try to bring people to your service and really compete with Netflix in a real way? Mm-hmm. Uh, because you're doing your originals. You've got all your HBO catalog. You've got uh, the Cinemax catalog. You've got... Um, you know, all of the uh the the Warner Brothers library to play with. So, mm-hmm. you know, like you've got some muscles to flex, and why not flex them at this time when it's gonna do you the most good? And, and they have said it's only the twenty twenty one slate that's doing this. Sure, like at once, the moment. Right. Once so. once you can get them real dollars at, at the theater, why wouldn't you? But I don't know. I mean, we'll see how much this actually changes things. I like the idea of having like a limited run window where it's like, hey, you know what? If you're really interested in watching this movie and you're a subscriber to our service, you can watch it at home the first two weeks it's out. Yeah. And, and then we take it away for a year or, you yeah. know, however long. Uh, I'm fine with that. You know, it gives me a value add for the thing I'm paying for. And it mm-hmm. gives me a choice. You know, as a consumer, I like the choice of saying, yeah, I can watch that at home. But if I had the choice of watching Dune in a theater safely or watch yeah. it at home, I'm going to go to the theater. But if I can't watch it safely in a theater, yeah. I'd rather watch it at home than not watch it at all. Yeah. It's also that thing as well. I think like it's not even just the fact that like life is different. You know, people, some people are not afforded the opportunity to have the time to go to a cinema. And now guess what? You know, they can pay for it. They're probably already paying for a service of some description, but now they can watch that with, you know, their loved one or something after working fucking 12 hours around the shifts and whatnot, where they can't travel 50 minutes to go to their nearest cinema to watch. It's all this stuff. Like, I think as consumers, we are so fucking spoiled and as businesses, the, the the cinema industry is the last big industry that I feel hasn't really grasped fully <laughs> the fact that people like sitting at home. <laughs> I know it yeah. sucks, but they will like they will make a night of it to go out and do something. But that you know, times have moved on that that's not always going to be a cinema. It's going to be something else, and you have to move with those times and just recognize that and. We'll see. As I hear, 
We'll see how it looks at the end of that year. But I'll be interested to see like what happened with the tenant. The tenant's a great example of that. You know, we'll put this movie out and then it you know hugely underperformed because no one was going to the cinema and cinemas were open and no one was going to the cinemas. Mm-hmm. And yet everyone else, like if all these if all these fucking companies at that point really, really cared about the cinema experience, they would have released their movies. And none of them did. They all pulled them off the shelf uh, because that movie underperformed. So ultimately, at the end of the day, these film companies are interested in, wait for it, money, Bo. Uh, and cinemas are interested in money. And the only way, you know, these things work themselves out is by allowing films to come out, which means directors can make other films, studios to release movies so they can get some money back to finance movies, and in time, people will go back to the cinema. That is, it's a circle of life. Hey, to ya. <laughs> yes, that. <laughs> so, Duncan. Yes. I, I, I feel we have fully satisfied the curiosity of our readers. We've um, just given them like an hour of hawking t-shirts, good movies, bad movies, our view on the world, our view on Predator, why big studios are bad, why Netflix rules, our mutual love for David Lynch, um, that great, you know, him spatting out about uh, watching movies on the fucking phone, and uh, why David Fincher is God and needs to rule all. And I think, I think it might be time to bring it in. Yep. So mm. the episode nine of Lovecraft Country is where we're going to begin tonight. The episode is entitled Rewind 1921. Yep. Re- rewind. And the clock says, Mm-hmm. And... <laughs> <laughs> so- this, is, this, is, this is the episode I'm really excited about because this is the one where we get, gotta go back in time. Yeah, we've, we've got honest-to-goodness time travel, which we have been talking about uh, a fair amount on this show. Um, mm-hmm. and we knew like early on people were talking time machine. So this is no surprise. The multiverse shit was the surprise. Yeah. Um, because once again, we were thinking two dimensionally and this show was thinking omni dimensionally, Bo. Omni. Yeah. There's, uh, we'll, we'll get into it. But so we, we kind of begin where we ended with, uh, the, the last episode, which is, Hey, after, uh, all of the all of the shenanigans with D and and these horrifying figures that have been chasing her around. Uh, where we left it was one of them gnawing on her arm. Yeah, and <laughs> while Montrose was like, "Hey, somebody needs to help us," and <laughs> and so we start this episode with Ruby and Letty and Tick and Montrose kind of gathered around D because remember Hippolyta is still off in fucking space or whatever. Yeah. And her arm is all fucked up after getting chewed on by the, these, you know, uncle Tom's cabin characters. Yeah. It kind of looks like a rasher of bacon that's been left in just a bit too long though. And it's went past that delicious crispy stage to the, yeah, this is cremated. <laughs> yeah. The, like we've got to toss all this out and, <laughs> and we've committed a grave error. Um, <laughs> <laughs> breakfast is ruined and I, yes i will complain that the coffee's too wet yes <laughs> she looked too sweet too um <laughs> so d's all all unconscious while everybody is blaming everybody yes which it, is what, what, that's the most honest thing that would happen it's like well you were looking after well you were doing and no one's acknowledging the fact that a shoggoth appeared and ripped an entire police department shreds out in front of a house which i kind of love yeah uh, well you know we'll get to it it's it, <laughs> strangely not the biggest problem they've got in front of them no no this is uh, small potatoes <laughs> small shoggoth potatoes <laughs> i will have a pound of shoggoth potatoes please they're uh, they're kind of a golden color they're really delicious uh, mm, many eyes apparently <laughs> have you ever had a, a potato dish uh duncan uh it's called leonese uh potatoes uh <laughs> It's very, How do you make them? It's quite delicious. It goes well with a steak or chicken. It really just anything. <laughs> um, I love you more than I've loved any other man right there. <laughs> still, you, you really do complete me and you get me. Um, <laughs> and if no one else gets that reference, then you are all living in a terribly cold world and I'm living in. I'm basking in the glory of Bo's warmth. Sure. So. As you should. And 
Uh, Tick is like, uh, hey, uh, we need to call Christina and and trade the pages <laughs> for her. <Yes. laughs> yeah. And Letty's like, oh, shit. Um, She's over there pulling on our collar going, hey, it's getting hot in here, guys. <laughs> Someone crack a window. Yeah, it's real. <laughs> and, but she pretty quickly is like, look, I gave those to Christina to make you invulnerable, but she didn't do that. She made me invulnerable. Yeah, I, I love that because there's no real way to make this sound non-self. Right. And Montrose is immediately like, hey, that sounds like bullshit. And <laughs> bull to the shit. Yeah. Bull to the shit, mister. And <laughs> <laughs> and and as they start to like come at each other, Ruby gets in the way. And th- there, there's a real good in the background Ruby saying, you better back up. Yep. <laughs> oh, it does my heart good. I like it when Ruby is feisty. And she almost lets it spill that that Letty's pregnant, but Letty mm-hmm. kind of stops her. It's like, hey, hey, we got enough shit to deal with. <laughs> like, Let's not get hasty here. Right. right. <laughs> A lot of shit's flying around right now. And and Tig is like, all right, look, the pages were the last leverage we had. So I don't know what we're going to do. And Ruby says, no, no, no. Extina's going to do it for me. Mm-hmm. And so... She sure enough, Xena shows up and she's like, "Wow, did you see these drawings? They're great." And they're like, "Yeah." And she's like, "I can tell what kind of curse they put on her just because of how good these pictures are. I mean, seriously, mm-hmm. they are very good." And they're like, "Yeah." The, I mean, can you help her? Yeah, can we move this along, please? And she's like, I can't get rid of it. I would need the book of names. Um, do you have that? And they're like, no, we don't have the book of names. And she's like, well, then we're going to need Lancaster, the guy who put the curse on her. And Liddy's like, oh, that's kind of a problem, too. <laughs> so we get we, we do get a, a, an indication because we thought his arm had just been ripped off. But um, apparently off camera, all chewed up both. <laughs> Yes, but there's a reason we didn't see that, as we'll get to in a moment. Um, and when Letty says, like, oh, no, he's gone, uh, Xena is like, really? Mm. How did that happen? And Letty's like, uh, gas explosion? Yeah, g- 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 gas. <laughs> gas. Like, explosion of the g- gas. So, yeah, like, and everyone's like, yeah, like, yeah, but while she's seeing gas explosion, someone's like, electrical, no, ga- gas, yeah, that's yes. right, yeah, gas. <laughs> what she said, um, yeah, it was a like, real Rudy yeah. Giuliani <laughs> gas leak. Dude, I've, I've spoken about this, I said, we're gonna have to date this right now. Um, but I've, I was speaking to Darren earlier on today, we were doing a recording for podcasts on the stairs, and I was <laughs> that I I like to consider myself a fairly mature person. I've watched Rudy Giuliani fart on on you know <laughs> whilst like give like trying to give a dress dressing down to, um you know an elected official about 75 times and it, it keeps getting funnier every time I see it. It's the look on the lady's face. <laughs> she is fucking the, that is she immediately perks up. It's that like perk and look of like oh my god somebody just farted right next to me. Oh it's so good Duncan. It's delicious. <laughs> you if you have not seen it just <laughs> yeah this has like this isn't a political thing it, somebody no, the, somebody fucking amazing. <laughs> farting in front of a government body is Bobby always funny up. yeah completely Bobby mic'd up and tries to like tries to roll through it but the lady beside him is having none of it she is like no <laughs> you farted sir the good pardon me the the, the gentleman from, from new york <laughs> point of order the gentleman from new york has just dealt it <laughs> just like the, the, the whole thing the seth rogan scene from stepbrothers where he's like is that onions and ketchup yeah it's yeah it's anyway it's a delight listeners if you haven't oh. just google rudy giuliani farting and that's yeah. what that'll get you right there i promise you, you, you yeah. <laughs> okay you right I'll get you right there and trust me you will you will watch it a lot it's, it's 
it's very he is, funny. Like, he is the 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 most entertaining thing that has happened this year. Like him melting and him like <laughs> him like like apparently taking a microphone off while unbuttoning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this like the the hot mess of twenty twenty ought to go to Rudy Giuliani. Oh, if he's not Times Person of the Year, I think we've we've made a mistake. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, b- back to the show. Gas, gas. Boy. Yeah. Tick T- T- is like, hey, uh, how about you just take my blood? And she's like, no, your blood isn't some cure all for everything, <laughs> Mister <Ew>. Stupid. <laughs> <It's like> you. <laughs> <laughs> and she so she's like i can do a restoration spell and it can reset the cycle of the curse but eventually you know yeah and <laughs> she says the only way she'll do it is if tick willingly comes back to artem for mm. the the equinox and, and the spell i was like, no because we know what that means right and so she's like so you know toodles I got some business to do, and in the meantime, you guys need to channel some intention. And mm-hmm. then when I get back, you better have some drawings on the ground. And so she takes off, and they're like, well, I guess we're going to have to get some blood from Montrose, who is Dee's closest living relative. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. put a pin in that for a second. <laughs> <laughs> so we cut to the uh captain lancaster mm-hmm. who is literally falling apart he is he's frankenstein's monster right now right well like cops are literally carving up black dudes that they have taken off the street mm-hmm. and we're trying to frankenstein them together with magic but every time they put them together his nipples explode and <laughs> you know as, as happens and uh, and he just starts coming apart again. Mm-hmm. And William enters and yes. uh, is like, huh, you seem to be having a rough day, Captain. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. And he's like, you know, I got the idea when I was perfecting a metamorphosis spell that regeneration could be a curse, too. And then casually pulls out the stone that Ruby hid. Remember the stone that Ruby had like right. fucking episodes ago that I had completely forgotten about. Well, right. So when she pulls it out, it's like, oh, that's of course, mm-hmm. you know, well done, Lovecraft Country, for being once more smarter than me and <laughs> for for tying up loose ends. Yeah, something I'm not used for TV shows to do. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> fuck you, Lost. And then Lancaster, <laughs> who's like, hey, are you Christina? And, and she's like, look, when William died, uh, he died a thousand times because of mm-hmm. all the times I was him and then like his skin split open and, but yeah. it was me underneath. And yeah. have you ever seen the movie, the prestige kind of like that, but kind of sexier. Yeah. It's uh, a sexy prestige. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> With less drowning. <laughs> Much, like a hundred percent less drowning. Well, <laughs> well I don't know. She didn't, yeah, time. but she didn't die, so it's no. like fifty percent less drowning. <laughs> and <laughs> so Lancaster, uh, uh, as he's coming apart, uh, she's like, "Look, I I know you can only die one time. I just want to watch it." Yeah, and and that's what happens. Like he just slowly, like the lights go out in his eyes, mm-hmm. and she drinks it in. Yeah, she comes hard, bro. <laughs> oh man, as that powerful. Oh. oh, just as as moist as the Tennessee Valley. Don't <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the the uh, agency uh, mm-hmm. slash, you know, George and Hippolyta and and Dee's house, Montrose is having a drink in the basement, and Tick comes in and is like, "Are you fucking serious?" <laughs> He's back in the sauce, but it's somewhat is clear stuff and it's right from a, like a, a jar. Yeah. <laughs> Which is usually like a, a good old fashioned warning that this might be moonshine. <laughs> yeah. And so Tick grabs it away from him, but he takes a drink before he puts it away. And he it, wishes he hasn't right after it tastes <laughs> yeah. He's like, is this gasoline? And Montrose is like, you know, I don't know. It was Uncle George's put a pin in that. Uh, it was his <laughs> recipe. I don't know what he put in it, but I know it made Dad go blind. Uh, 
And <laughs> and uh, Montrose is like, you know, uh, I just want to be of use to people. And Tick has a really nice moment where he's like, no, look, you saved my life. You're giving your blood to save D. You're doing everything you can. Like you're you're a good you're helping us out and you're being the man you ought to be. Yeah. And uh then <laughs> uh immediately Montrose is like, Well, you know, uh <laughs> yeah. that thing about <laughs> offering my blood, I've got a surprise, mister. <laughs> you might be George's son. And Atticus is like, wait a second, did my mother cheat on you and he's like huh, no it was nothing like that it's just hey did i tell you about tulsa and he's like mm -hmm. yeah yeah you told me about it a million times and he's like when you go through something like that with someone it creates an unbreakable bond and tech is like look this is do you know how many times i sat in the chair you're in looking at uncle george wishing he was my father mm-hmm and then Letty comes in and it's just like, oh, is, <laughs> is this a bad time? Letty <laughs> comes in the, I'm walking on sunshine. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Hey, good news. That white sorceress is back. Um, and Dee's fever uh, is, is about down to normal. And as all of this is floating around, in comes Hippolyta. Rocking the blue mind not, group here. Not yet, not yet, Duncan. Oh. It's normal hair for when she first shows up. It doesn't happen until later. Yeah, it goes blue later. We'll talk about it. No, no, no. This, oh, she after looks, the thing. Yep, 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 yep. You're right. You're right. You're she right, looks right. normal now, and and but she. Let walks. me just rewind that, Bo. Re rewind. <laughs> yeah. Selector. Just like the title of the episode. Oh my God! It's like all the PCs fitting. It's like the circle of life, Bo. Hey. <laughs> so Himalaya comes in and she's like wait a second is D sick hmm. and they're like oh we <laughs> yikes <laughs> and, so Hans will start pointing at the uh, he did it <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh, Extina is upstairs and she's doing her chanting and whatnot, and and cuts uh hippolyta's hand because she's shown up now mm -hmm. and so closest living relative and all that and um d is just becoming one of the things that was chasing her yeah it's like a total like you are becoming the thing that you beheld mm -hmm. and uh when exina gives the, like kind of reverses the spell or at least resets it um flies and maggots come out of her arm yeah and and then she's she's not okay, but it's like it, it's like she just got bit by these things. Yeah, yeah, she said a bit. So a rewind, boy. Hmm. Ah, oh, I sense a theme. <laughs> and then outside, uh, Exine and Ruby are taken off together, and Letty stops Ruby, and she's like, "Look, you can't trust Christina." And Ruby is like, oh, really? Because the way I'm looking at it, she saved your life, mm -hmm. um, has helped try to save D, told you what you need to do, which is get this book of names. I don't know that she's done anything to hurt either of us. So, you know, and she has a great line where she says, you ought to be getting in this car with me. Mm -hmm. And then Letty is like, really? Why don't you ask her about the autumnal equinox and why Tick has to go willingly, which probably means she's going to kill him there. And Ruby's just like, all right, well, I'll talk about it if it comes up. And then she takes off with uh, Extina. And meanwhile, uh, Hippolyta starts packing Woody up. And Tick is like, uh, what's going on? <laughs> you just arrived. You just got back. <laughs> yeah. And she says, what is the source of this magic that you guys are talking about? And they're like, well, we've got to go get this book of names, but we don't know where it is. It went missing in Tulsa during the riots. In 1921, Bo. In 1921. And Hippolyte is like, fine, we're going to go to the observatory. We're going to use the machine to hop multiverses, go back to Tulsa. Get the book, come back, save D. We got yep. 40 hours, we can make it. Yep. And uh, 
They're like, multi what? <laughs> yeah, and they're like, the machine's broken. She's like, I'll fucking fix it. Don't even worry about this shit. I'm on it. <laughs> I've, and and then she says, I've been on infinite worlds and been granted infinite wisdom. I'm going to use all of it to save my daughter. And you're like, fucking Hippolyta has become the secret hero of this show. She, she is the hero of this show. She is the fucking, she is like, she's a walking battery as well, but we're going to get to that. Yeah. But, oh, she, like, Hippolyta is awesome in this. Like, I love a show where a character that was like, okay, I like her becomes just like, this character is fucking amazing. Well, she's she's achieved the potential, the infinite potential that she thought she could achieve against the backdrop of that great interaction that she had with George in the multiverse, where she talked about her shrinking um, and making these small concessions. And now she's she realised that, and she ain't fucking around at all. She gave up everything to come back and be Dee's mother. And she's arrived, Dee's in trouble, so she's going to use everything in her power to make it right. And I love it. I love everything about her character. Uh, she is, like, once again, this actress fucking knocks it out of the park. Yeah. She, just always fantastic. And so we go to Extina, who is in the lab. In, the, in I was working late in the lab one night. Yeah. On the <laughs> <Yeah>. slab. <laughs> um, she's in the lab. And Ruby <laughs> is hanging out beside the old lady racist uh, that she turns into sometimes. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> which is her character's name, old lady racist. Well, it, um. Ruby asks like, "Who was she?" and and she says like, "Her name was I don't even remember like Hillary." Yeah, she was something. the she was the 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 helper, and your sister killed her with a speed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's like, "How'd she end up like this?" And and Xena's like, "Well, your sister hit her with a shovel," <laughs> and it was pretty good. And Ruby kind of grills Xena about like all this Atticus spell shit, mm-hmm. and Xena is like look uh is it gonna kill him probably so i need kill him, smell him i mean i need i love, all it, of I love how well, we've spoken about this before but i will give this to christina all the way through this show she doesn't lie i i, I, I kind of love that about her she's just basically like this is what i need to do this is what i'm gonna do this is the consequences what i'm gonna happen but you're missing the big point here i become immoral <laughs> so it's always coming yeah. back to like yeah these things are gonna happen but me me look at me i will be immoral and that's 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 a good thing isn't it yeah and and uh ruby is like just promise me you're not gonna hurt letty and xena is like look i spent all my life just watching men sit around talking about magic like they talked about money. It was just a, mm-hmm. a thing they could possess and hoard. But I'm going to experience it. I'm going to live a lifetime of firsts. And then Ruby strolls over and turns the oxygen off on, on our white lady. Mm-hmm. And she says, you know, I always saw myself if I was going to be a white lady. I thought I would be a redhead. And Extina kind of gives her a smile like, hell yeah, let's kill some more old racists. And <laughs> so we cut to Kentucky and the observatory. Mm-hmm. And Montrose is outside. He takes a long drink as, he, <laughs> as he's, he's just can continuing on. Like once you like once you've committed to a bender bowl, you need to see that through. Well, and also he knows in theory he's about to go back to Tulsa, like and, the worst time of his life, right? And, and even more so because we will find out why it was the worst time. There are things he has not told us about, which we will see firsthand, and they are wait for it, fucking awful. Well, and also he's just had this big blow up with Atticus, yeah, and and who is like you know you are not my father, like that's where Atticus's head is. Mm-hmm. So Montrose is going into the worst moment in his life at a point where he doesn't even feel like there's this connection with his son. Yeah. And 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 also having these flashbacks we'll later learn, like some of the voices he's hearing are his father's. Yeah. And so anyway, inside, Letty is kind of hanging out with Dee and getting her organized and, and kind of uh, you know, under a blanket and, and settled while Hippolyta is fixing the machine. And Montrose comes up there uh, to, with Letty uh, up in this little gangplank. And um, 
Letty is like, listen, you need to understand why I've got invulnerability. I know how this looks. <laughs> and he's like, I know. And <laughs> he's like, you're pregnant. I know. Atticus knows. Everyone knows. <laughs> and Letty is like, what? And, and he goes, yes, he went to the future too, mister. And she's like, the fuck? So you know that I'm pregnant and all that stuff. And he's like, look, I just have to let you know what you're doing might have a hand in the death of my son. Mm. And there's just no making that right, mister. So, you know, it's just going to be a thing. And, and she's like, Hey, uh, so it's a boy. Mm. And he's like, uh, oh, <laughs> maybe I said too much. <laughs> and and so the, the as she's like getting this news the machine kicks on because hippolyte has fixed it mm -hmm. and now they're like okay so what do we got to do and she's like well look this goes through multiverses so we got to find this earth at this time and they're just like uh all right <laughs> multi multiverse uh-huh and, and, and Lilu the, Dallas Multipass. Um, sorry. And she, <laughs> yeah, and she's like, look, this computer needs a motherboard. And they're like, oh, what? <laughs> and she's like, look, uh, don't worry. I got this taken care of. I've basically just got to jack into the Matrix here. <laughs> and but, but she's like, before I do that, whatever the fuck is going on with all of you people, leave it here mm -hmm. because you've got to go there to save my daughter. Yeah. So enough bullshit. And so Hippolyta then jacks into this machine with her purple magic she got from, you know, <laughs> being a mortal in the multiverse and all. And <laughs> it's a sense I didn't think we'd ever get to when we started this show. And I, I'm so glad we did. I know. Like nothing about this is is making me unhappy. <laughs> and uh so Montrose like hesitates before he jumps back through. But finally he does like he, he mm. hears some more voices of his father and whatnot. And, but he goes through and now we're at the Stratford hotel in 1931 mm -hmm. or 1921 rather. 21. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. And so music's playing on a radio. Montrose is looking out the window of this like really nice seeming early century city mm -hmm. where like, it is a clearly a black neighborhood, but everybody's kind of milling around and happy and everybody looks like, you know, uh, successful. Like it looks like a prosperous yeah, life, community. Life looks like it's going well. Yeah. And like, there's talk of a dance that might be canceled, but maybe not. And they're like, what the fuck is going on? And Montrose is like, it was the high school prom. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he's like, you know, just a few hours from now, they, Mayhem is going to start after they canceled it. And that's the same night. It turns out that uh, Tick's mother's house is burned with everyone mm -hmm. inside it. So Tick is like, uh, look, we don't have enough time to fuck around. We got to get in and get out. He swipes some clothes uh, that were left out in the hallway. And they head to his mother's house to get the book of names. Mm -hmm. Letty notably still has her sneakers on and it looks great. <laughs> it does look great. It's a great combo. Maybe not for 1921. <laughs> right. As, as we will find out. So <laughs> um, on their way, Montrose stops by this kind of town square area, like a statue in the middle of, of, of uh, this spot. Mm -hmm. And um, he has a flashback and it's some kind of violent scene. And Montrose, uh, get like tick gives them a little bit of bullshit about like hey uh, we don't have time for this we gotta keep moving and montrose yeah. is like look you don't know what war is mister you're about to see some shit and mm -hmm. tick is like look man as soon as this is over we are done i took all of your bullshit when i thought you were my father now that i know you're not i don't have to put up with nothing as soon as we yeah, go it also smells the drink on him as well he yeah goes, oh. Fucking raw on him. Yeah. Is, has had it with Montrose. He is done. Absolutely mm -hmm. done with this guy. So they get to the house. 
Yeah, just in time to see why the phrase, the acorn doesn't fall far from the tree, um, can sometimes be apt, Bo. Yeah, man. So it's Montrose's and George's dad hauling Montrose out onto the yard and telling him to to get a switch. Yeah, uh, which for those that, for those out there that don't know what a switch is, it's a, it's a good old-fashioned whipping stick. Yeah, the thinner the better. Yeah. Because that makes it more of a whip. And yeah, it's nice and aerodynamic, so when it hits your flesh, it it can cut right through that skin. Which I mean, which is what you want to do to your small child. Right. Jesus. And Montrose explains what had happened was George was going to the prom with Dora, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Atticus's mother. And not the explorer. Right. <laughs> not the explorer in this case. <laughs> I am smiling Dora. just now because I said something funny. <laughs> it's you, you did very good. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So he says, like he he got caught in George's prom jacket, and also George had a corsage that like he put in his hair or something. Mm. And when his father caught him doing this, he dragged him out into the yard, like basically is calling him a sissy and all that, and. When Montrose is narrating this, Letty and uh, Tick are looking on, and they're just like, "Holy fuck!" Can yeah, because you... he gets fucking worked on. Yeah, well, like, this does not. The camera doesn't shy away from this either. It's one of the more horrific things I've seen in the entire series. Yeah, and George is kind of standing there watching. Yeah, as a kid, you know, and Montrose says, you know. That was an expensive jacket, and it was his prom night. I was, I deserved it. And Letty's like, nobody deserves this. Yeah. And it, like, it's, again, it's uh, like these moments we get into why Montrose is who he is. Mm. And it's this stuff where you're like, oh, man. Like, he was just repeating this cycle and blah, yeah. blah, blah. And, um, so, anyway, Dora, uh, Atticus's mother, Comes out of her house, and again, she's a teenage girl, but she stands in front of Montrose and his father. Yeah. And, um, you know, the Montrose's dad is like, you know, girl, get out of the way. And her dad comes out and is like, <laughs> hey, love <laughs> listen, motherfucker, you can do whatever you want to your kids. Like, that's your business. But don't you dare raise a hand to my child. Mm-hmm. And he's, then, he, you know, Montrose's dad kind of drunkenly staggers off. And as he does, he kind of pats George on the shoulder and says, at least there's one other man in the house. Yeah, yikes. And kind of goes back inside. And Dora immediately gives George shit about, like, you should have helped your brother, who, by the way, has run off. Yeah. Like, Montrose, the, the boy Montrose has run off. And um, Montrose is like, you know... That wasn't right. Uh, George actually helped me more than anyone. And it was like, it's a really nice character moment where he's like, you know, like, I know what it looks like, but George saved me more than you think. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I think that's really uh, sweet and sad all at once. Yeah. Yeah. And, but George ends up giving Dora this corsage. And it's at this point that somebody comes by and lets them know that the prom's been canceled. So they just say, hey, we need to go find Montrose and get him off the street. Yeah. And while they're watching this, Letty and Tick are like, boy, that is some shit. We are really sorry, Montrose. Montrose? <laughs> and, He's also gone. <laughs> yeah. And Tick is like, God damn it. He has gone to tell George that he's going to be shot on that bridge. He's yeah. He's mentioned it to me that... You know, he's going to try to save George's life. And, and Hippolyte, I told them before they went through there, don't be messing with no time. <laughs> right, like they can't affect the timeline. It's very mm-hmm. back to the future kind of rules. And so they split up and Letty is like, I'm going to go get the book. You're going to go get Montrose. We're going to meet back at the hotel. Mm-hmm. So Letty, awesomely hot wires an old car <laughs> for Atticus to go chase Montrose. And but before he goes, he kind of looks at her belly and he says, uh, or he he's looking at her belly, uh, like, hey, you know, I know you know that I know yeah. you're pregnant. <laughs> and it's, it's okay, the audience knows as well. Yeah. And Letty has a, a nice moment where she just kind of says with a sigh, 
we should name him George. Yeah. And it's like, oh, that's nice. Um, but anyway, so Montrose uh, passes by a car in an alley that has some booze in it. So he just smashes in the window to grab a bottle. Because like you said, when you're on a bender. Wait, yeah, if you, you're going to, you have to commit fully. There's no, like, no half measures pun included uh like for, for this you have to you have to and like i get the feeling that when montrose like wants to get drunk he he does he does some serious drinking bro <laughs> yeah it's serious right like he is not yeah. fucking around so while he's getting <laughs> turnt um letty <laughs> uh is getting chased and shot at like the the sun is setting mm-hmm. and there uh she is getting chased and shot at by some white dudes in a pickup truck yeah and she actually gets hit by a bullet knocked down but she's invulnerable so it doesn't it doesn't really hurt her it just kind of knocks her off balance and she ends up kind of falling into the lawn of Mm -hmm. uh you know dora's house and dora and george's dads are there like shooting back at these (laughs) white arms to the fucking teeth yeah it's like we're all right if this is what's going down this is what's going down yeah and (laughs) So she is pulled inside where inside the house, everybody is starting to kind of slowly realize like, oh, th- some real heavy shit is going down. Yeah. Like, things are about to get dark real quick. Right. Like I was on the phone with somebody and suddenly got cut off and like, yes, things, things have popped off. And um, anyway, so <laughs> they start just handing guns to everybody, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just in a drawer i love that she's like this is my gun drawer yeah. right it's just like look white folks sometimes be going crazy and we got to have guns in the eventuality mm-hmm. and so there is a straight up witch <laughs> who is it's actually i guess it's atticus's great great grandmother is who she yeah. is but she is uh the elder matron of the family and she's got eyes on letty it's just like Mm-hmm. does not <laughs> trust letty at all no uh, it doesn't help that the one thing she's noticed that doesn't match with the whole ambient so to speak is that pair of what looks like converse <laughs> yeah and so so atticus then we cut over to him who he has found montrose who is looking from this alley onto this he's square. right back where he was earlier on yeah where he kind of had his little momentary freak out And Atticus is like, you cannot warn George. Mm -hmm. And Montrose is like, I'm not here to warn George, stupid. It's a boy named Thomas. He got shot in the head tonight. And Atticus is like, the fuck is Thomas? Mm -hmm. So we cut away from that to Letty, who is now keeping watch at one of the windows on the ground floor of this place. And one of Dora's sisters rolls up on her and is like, hey, um, I know we're going to be fine, but I'm worried about the other people who are out on the street, and I kind of have a crush on George Freeman from next door, but you won't tell my sister, will you? And Letty's just looking at her like, you fucking dead son of a bitch. Oh, (laughs) shit. Oh, shit. You are about to burn up alive. Holy fuck. And... (laughs) And she's like, oh, we're going to be totally fine. And Letty's keeping it all buttoned up. But she is like, she's, uh-huh, you're going to be fine. Ghost! <laughs> charcoal! Charcoal! <laughs> so, so we leave Private Dead Meat and Letty for a second. <laughs> To go over to Montrose, who is like, yeah, uh, I had kind of forgotten all about this shit until I saw this earlier. It turns out this kid named Thomas and I were kind of gay when we were kids, mm-hmm. but we didn't really do anything about it. We just kind of knew. And yeah. and Tick's like, you can't do this. Like, if you save this kid and I'm not born, then that means the son I'm about to have is never going to have been born. Like, none of, think about what you're sacrificing here. And Montrose is like, oh, I have. <laughs> uh, but <Mr>. then... 
But then he has this really, it's it's such a sad moment for him where he's. It, like, it, it, it really is, but at the same time, I think it puts like it puts a lot of the a lot of everything that's happened between him and Tick in context. I think that's why it's sad, but at the same time, like he he's he's so sure, so resolutely sure that if he saves Thomas, Tick will still exist and the, the grandkid will still exist because he knows that you know he, he obviously got married to Tick's mum. He knows that George is the father. Um, he was never the father. However, he took that responsibility on because that's what he he always wanted to be. Tick's dad, and nothing will ever change that, regardless of it. I, I mean, I understand the sentiment. I also understand that time time travel doesn't work that way. Um, but you know, in his heart of hearts, he's like, you know, like nothing would take away that. Like that is who he is, regardless of anything else uh, that might happen. He chose to be Tick's dad, and that's the most important thing to him. And you can kind of see, like in Tick's eyes, this kind of realization. Of it, well, yeah, he still can't do what he wants to do, but at the same time, I, 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 like a small measure of, I, I kind of finally get my dad. I finally kind of understand, because all like we've seen, like he's he's such a fascinating character arc in this one because at times he's done stuff that we thought. Remember when he killed the hermaphrodite Amazon right, thing, yeah. thing? Like we've seen all these things that he's done. And yeah, part of us could look at it from a selfish perspective of, well, he's being a coward and all the rest, but legitimately everything he has done is so he can remain Tick's dad. Um, like every decision like that, when you put in that context, even though he's got a very blunt and often troubled way of handling things, nothing will ever take away from the fact that he genuinely does love his son, even though he's fully aware that, you know, biologically speaking, he's not the dad. That is just... It's just biology, um, you know the the, the actual the, the core sentiment and the value of that doesn't need to be bi- biological. What it needs to be is is in the heart, and that's where he's coming from. It and it's just, it's fucking like wonderful, like kind of le- let me lay my soul bare for you. <laughs> it's the, yeah, it's this raw, really, really sweet touch and speech, which ultimately, at the end of the day, regardless of this, he can't like. And I think there is a realization he cannot, like, even with all this out, he can't save Thomas because if he does, it's a wrinkle in, in the, the fabric of time which will undo things. Yeah, well, um, and Atticus steps aside for it. Like, there are a couple yeah. of lines I would I would point out, and as you said, it's a, a fantastic speech. I'm not doing all of it, but yeah, the, and uh, once again, another amazing part. Like, once again, like, what, 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 can we have a, an amazing monologue delivered by a, a terrific actor? We can. Can we have it in this scene? Go for it. Yeah, and yeah, he, he steals the fucking episode for me he, in, in this scene. He says when he's talking about Thomas, he says Thomas won't matter much. He's just the first in a long line of sacrifices I made to be your father. Fucking great. Oh, it's heartbreaking. And Mm -hmm. then later he said, when, because he's kind of narrating what's happening where like he's basically kind of breaking up with Tom, like after getting beaten by his father for being too effeminate, he goes to the boy who he has feelings for to tell him we can't be friends anymore because you're gay. Yeah, and and Montrose says at this moment, I cut out all the soft parts of myself. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, what a! I mean, just a great bit of writing, great delivery. Uh, but any, but like you say, he's like, I would do it all, all of this over again because I want to be your father. And yeah. and so at that point, Atticus steps out of his way and is like, Hey, if you don't think this is going to fuck anything up, and you want to try to save this boy, I'm not going to stand in your way. Yeah, and, but but he doesn't. And yeah. uh, so we leave that scene, which is a, a really terrific scene um, between two really good actors, you know? Yeah, yeah. This show just, like, it, honestly, when you think the bar can't be raised any higher, the show just, and it does it effortlessly. It finds right. a way shifting gears in a way which is head scratchingly good. Um, where, you know, it's it, like, we've, this is the same episode we've, we've goofily talked about multiverses and time travel. And then you get a scene like this in it, and it's just like well, how it does it, how it manages to find that balance is beyond me. It, I, I don't yeah. understand how it does it so well. It's like uh, when people talk about elevated horror. I think 
the elevation in Lovecraft Country is of the melodrama that yeah. all of this like interpersonal stuff that should be kind of crazy and schlocky and silly. And when you write it down on paper, it kind of is, mm-hmm. but also it just it, like the acting and the writing of it makes it feel so emotionally honest that as ridiculous yeah. as the setting is of like, this is a guy and his, gay dad back (laughs) back in time at the Tulsa riots discussing you know why his father is who he is and like that totally works in the context of the show and it's it's amazing that it does Mm -hmm. um but at any rate so we go go back to the house where uh the the great great grandmother (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it catches Letty just totally turning over a room to look for this book. <laughs> and she's like, what are you doing in here? And Letty's like, nothing. <laughs> I got a poop. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's like, oh, uh, I was just, uh, I thought I heard something. And then she just straight up pulls a gun on Letty. Mm-hmm. And she says, you have felt off ever since you got here. Also, I don't, I don't recall ever seeing shoes like that before. And Letty's like, okay, how about this? I'm from the future. I am your great, great grandson's girlfriend and I'm carrying his baby and we need the book of names. What about that? And And she's like, well, why didn't you say so in the first place? (laughs) Yeah. And, but then after a second, she's like, wait a second, you had to come back here for the book. Yeah, she just walks out this really quick. <laughs> yeah. The way that other characters might not. <laughs> yeah, and almost immediately is like, we die here tonight, don't we? And Letty's like, <laughs> <laughs> Ghost! Um, <laughs> so, and we kind of have these split scenes where we're seeing Thomas and Montrose as boys take hands mm-hmm. while they're being chased by some white dudes that show up uh, to harass them. And while the old lady is seeing someone tossing a Molotov cocktail at their house. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing you know, Thomas is literally getting his brains blown all over Montrose. Over his face, right over his face. It's fucking horrific. Right. And it's one of those things of like, holy shit, psychologically, like when, uh, if there is an argument to be made for well, why didn't Montrose remember this? It's like, this would have been one of the most traumatic things to have happened yeah, in his childhood in, on a traumatic night. And so losing this detail was probably more psychologically, it was a psychological defense, right? It was like, yeah. Was like, what, what would you want to remember from this night? Would you want to remember your, you know, your first crush have his head like, literally obliterated in front of you and the pieces come over you or that time a stranger appeared and saved you your brother and your future wife with a baseball bat out of nowhere from from the jaws of death i'd want to remember that i wouldn't want to remember the other things so there's a a a real reason why his brain has shielded himself off of this and focused on the story that you would tell over and over and over and over and over again which is the story of how they were saved yeah and, and why Montrose had that reaction when he saw the square of just like, yeah. holy shit, I remember now what happened there mm. and in and, and its entirety and what a nightmare that was. And anyway, so while that's happening, cut back to the, the house with Letty and, and, you know, Grandma Witchy. And, <laughs> and she's like, I got to go warn everybody. And Letty's like, you can't do that because if you do that, then they like, look, here's what happens uh george goes on to marry dora or i'm mm-hmm. um, sorry uh that no. uh, v- vice versa uh that montrose yeah. goes on to marry dora and you know george is gonna live and like the family's gonna go on i'm carrying your great 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 grandchild like if you if you don't die tonight none of none that of will that happen happens. yeah and this woman is like, all right, I guess that's what we got to do. Mm. And you're just like, I don't know if I have that kind of intestinal fortitude. <laughs> I, I I don't. I'd be like, <laughs> the jig is up. Yeah. He's got a gun. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> I think they call that a Dr. Becker moment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and so the old lady gets this book out and, and hands it to uh, Letty and is like, hey, here's a scrap of paper. It's bound. Like, I can't. I was told never, ever to open it, but here are some words to open it. I've never been brave enough to do that. And she hands the book to Letty. And she says, when my great, great grandson is born, he will be my faith made flesh. Yeah. Oh, great line. Great line. Yep. Um, and she, <laughs> Jinx, twinsies. And she tells Letty, like, you need to get out of here. And Letty says, nah, I'm spelled and I can't be hurt by fire. Mm. And so she, she's going to stay. Hey, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna stand right in front of you and watch you burn. Yeah, <laughs> I just thought I'd turn around or do something. <laughs> it's it, but so we'll get back to that in like two seconds. But then we go over to Tick and Montrose, who are watching as um, George and Dora show up to protect him. But all these kids, you know, all the the white folk have surrounded them and are beating them, and, and they actually do have a gun. Yeah. So. And and Tick is like, something's wrong. The guy that you always told me about isn't showing up. And we, then we Duncan fucks... went, oh, shit, Lovecraft Country. Right. And when, the he's... Penny drop for me. <laughs> when he says, uh, the guy isn't showing up to save him, he mm-hmm. takes a step forward and says, they must have fucked something up. Mm-hmm. And then his foot kicks a bat. Yep. And he picks it up and he looks back at Montrose and Montrose is the one who's like, Oh yeah. He's like, like, you're the mysterious stranger. And Mm -hmm. tech then rushes him. Yeah. While amazing (laughs) back at the house. Oh yeah. That's right. We go back to the house and I'm like, no, he he rushes over. We cut back to the house and Letty and, and the old woman are praying. Yeah. And Letty is holding her hands while the fire starts to consume her. Yeah. And then we get some spoken word. It's a, a poem uh, by a woman named Sonia Sanchez called Catch the Fire. Mm-hmm. And it is all about how uh, it, uh, it it's like a call to action of like all the fires that have been used against you. Like, you know, uh, the people who made scraps into soul food, notes into into jazz, who fought against Jim Crow. Uh, she, you know, like calls out Nat Turner and Nelson Mandela. And so this is the narration that's happening as tick wades in and beats the ever living fuck out of these crackers. Yeah. And, and the great grandmother burns Mm -hmm. and it is, it's something, man. It like this show goes next level sometimes. And you're just like, Mm -hmm. God damn, this is good. And yeah, it's also it's also that realization. It plays into that. It plays into a satisfying. I hate things that like are messy with time travel. And whilst this is still kind of messy with time travel, it plays into that thing that this is already played out this way. Right. That that he, like he was the guy that they remembered, and so him being there in the future, or him coming from the future to the past, is what allows yeah. him to satisfy that moment. And yes, yes, it is like it's not a messy. It like it seems like a real neat loop of just like yes. <laughs> you know, like I'm sure there there are plenty of ways that I've got the you know astrophysics of this wrong or whatever. But it's like okay, this is this makes enough sense for me because time travels, like you said, it's always messy, and this yeah. feels neat enough that it's not yeah. Uh, it, it, it's not too expansive. And anyway, so the world beyond Duncan is just fucking mm-hmm. chaos. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> so Montrose and Tick are trying to get back to the, the hotel down this kind of main street, dodging gunfire and explosions uh, on their way back. And then when they get to the, the hotel, finally, Letty's not there. Mm-hmm. And Montrose is the one who's like, something's wrong. Look at that <laughs> fucked up portal. Yeah, the, and, the door's a bit sketchy. <laughs> yeah, and so Tick jumps through, and Hippolyta is now foaming at the mouth and generally not doing super well. No, no. So he's like, you gotta hang on. Like, we are <laughs> almost there. You gotta keep this open. And then Montrose looks out the window, just like he did when he first showed up earlier. 
Mm-hmm. Only now, instead of the the scene of people milling around and going to shops and getting in their cars and all that stuff, it's people running and screaming and dying. It's fucking war zone. Yeah, like literally because we are going to see Letty, like <laughs> we're going to see Letty walking up the street as, unless my eyes deceive me, but a plane flying by and dropping a bomb. Yeah, no, that that was a thing that really happened in the Tulsa riots. Is they dropped? Holy fuck! I yes. did not know that. Yes, that and is. It, it was the bit where I was like, "What the actual fuck?" Yes, I I believe I don't know if those were the locals or if that was the National Guard. Jesus Christ! But yes, the it, like the Wikipedia page on the Tulsa riots is one of the most depressing things you will ever read. Uh, but but as they describe and and here is like as Montrose is watching this, this is kind of when you you get him remembering people talking about this like the days following. Yeah, where yeah, he yeah. he's saying things like, um, you know, yeah, I remember, you know, they got the the best Negro surgeon in the entire United States, but old you know old so and so that he got the worst of it. And, yeah, and oh yeah the you know, Mrs. Carmichael's invalid daughter got burned up and she survived. And, you know, like all this stuff that he's remembering as he's seen it unfold. Mm -hmm. And then, um, we cut over to Hippolyta Uh who goes fucking super Saiyan Mm -hmm. (laughs) and starts floating like storm from the (laughs) X-Men. And so as that's happening, we cut from that to Letty walking down the street, holding the book to her as, like you said, bombs are ex- literally exploding around her and she is walking through this fire. Yeah. And we see this great shot of Montrose from outside the hotel and you see this column of fire burning right up the middle of him. Oh, it's such a good shot. Uh and and then here's where we get we the cut back to Hippolyta as she's hanging on to this her hair turns blue blue like atomic blue as in just exactly like it's drawn in the comic yes and then Letty and Montrose jump back through and while this is happening and everybody's kind of holding each other and like holy fuck that was way worse than we thought it was going to be Mm-hmm. Um, you hear the same catch the fire poem, only now it's being sung as an elegy. Yeah. Oh, Duncan, God damn this show. <laughs> I mean, that I've I've found all of that stuff to be really moving. You know what? It's, it's like the best episode of Quantum Leap that's ever existed. Yeah, yeah, it, it really, is. really fucking is. It's like the best episode of Quantum Leap you never got. Um. And I, I don't mean that in a schlocky way, as in just everything, like the attention to detail. I mean, this show's already got immaculate attention to detail for the period set, but the fact we get to play with a completely different period and time piece, and we, we go through everything that we do in this one, and it is a full-on emotional roller coaster from start to finish. And this is just the journey to get the book. You know what I mean? We still have a we, we still have to have an episode here where that book is going to be used. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for a setup to the finale, it's, it's fucking incredible. <laughs> yeah, it's it, because it it does all the things that all the episodes do, which is like you have these great character moments, especially with Montrose, and and sort of fleshing out and understanding his character in a way you didn't before. Um, you have these nice moments with Letty and 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 the ancestors of Atticus, mm-hmm. and kind of you know, mixing that up a little bit, I, which I really liked. And obviously Hippolyta going, you know, full Arithia blue yeah. at the end of this episode was like, fuck man, are you kidding me? Like, are we really going anime? Cause I am here for it. Let us, <laughs> yes, let us do this. And, and I thought I Duncan, here's what I thought. Oh, tell me what you thought. I thought at the end of this, I was like, look, I just don't know that they're going to have the fucking balls, Duncan, <laughs> to land this show in a satisfying way. Oh, I was the other way. Like, when this episode finished, I was like that. These guys have got it. I, 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 like, I, I, I didn't expect, I'll tell you right now, wait, how this show finishes, 
well, and we're going to get to that in the next episode, is maybe one of the greatest that there ain't nothing I've ever seen that has done this sort of thing. So you've got that to look forward to in the next couple of, well, the next hour. But I was so full of confidence that they had it sorted by this point because I'm like, everything they've touched in this show uh, in the nine episodes now, they've done immaculately. That how could, how could they fuck this up? Well, so I, I was like, if we, we, we are the the glass half empty, glass half full coming out of this one. And that I was I was full of, yeah, this is going to be amazing. And um, I, I'm usually the other way around. It's usually, we've swapped places. It's usually well, me that's like, oh, this is where it's all going to fall apart. It, it's, uh, it's, it's like, they've got you, baby. It's okay. It's not. It's cool, baby. Um, <laughs> baby. It's not that I don't feel that like Misha Green and all the creators behind Lovecraft Country don't have it in them to make a great finale. I just tend to think the ends of things generally can be satisfying, but it's very rarely my favorite part. Because well, yeah, I, I think, let me tell you something right now. The TV shows that on the final episode will tread a lot of water and then in the last 10 minutes give you the Bet you can't wait for the next season. And I'm like, yeah, I can't wait for the next season from those 10 minutes. But everything leading up to that felt fairly pedantic. Um, and that's the danger, is that you, you've you given us so much story that you and you want to realistically return for a new season that it makes how that satisfyingly bringing all those strings together in a way where I don't have to wait a year and a half to find out the importance of the book of names or so, you know, like these sort of things. Um and I also think there's a foolhardy thing with that as well, where TV shows get to a certain point. I always remember that show. You remember the show Flash Forward? I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it finished on one of the greatest like finishes of a show, which did meander a little bit, but it finished with this great. And I was like, that oh, season two, which never happened. Um, so like, and as a result, ninety five percent of the questions in that TV show were never answered because they were obviously like season two motherfuckers um that was like oh and you're like there is a, a level on that but just the craft i think i'd like i was i was like maybe too optimistic because there's like everything in here even down to the fact that they brought the, the mention that fucking stone that i'd forgotten about was well no this was here and it was used for a purpose and this is why i sent her in here to do the thing that i did which i'd forgotten they'd done they're like, no, 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 this is Lovecraft Country. That like, Even when something is shown, the payoff all happens. So trust us. And yeah, I, as a result, I was fully on the, the, Love, the Lovecraft train, um, pulling into the, the final episode being the station. Uh, finish out that analogy there. Um, right, but but it, I was you know, fully on board. So, But for me, uh, I, I and I don't disagree with any of that. Like I said, I, I think that these are all talented people. But it's also like, well, we're going to do a season two. You know, like yes. we're not going to do a season. It, like, there's no way that's not going to happen. So the just stakes, want to stress at the moment, still not confirmed. That's crazy. Like, but also, was, well, she seems fairly confident. Like, like all the all the chat with her at the moment is, yeah, we're just we're just you know rounding off some stuff at the moment. COVID's put a bit of a a strain on right. things, but yeah, conversations also, are really fucking good right now with HBO. So. Also, my salary went way up, so we're trying to <laughs> we're trying to figure out how much I'm going to get paid for yeah. season two. Okay. HBO seems like really energetic at the negotiating table. I don't know why. It could yeah. be all these awards I'm going to win. Um, but but <laughs> it could be all this critical acclaim that you got. But because but yeah, like, I think like that, because I'm thinking about it in terms of it being television and not HBO, Duncan. Um, yes. that I'm thinking to myself, like, okay, well, the stakes are a little bit lower. Like, I kind of expect Extina's going to die. We might lose a character. Like, I really thought Montrose was probably going to go, um, or somebody like that. But, you know, our heroes are our heroes, and, and we're going to get to the end of this show. I don't know what, if we're going to try to do a cliffhanger or if we just kind of end the show in a place of, Hey, we're, we can go on to a new story from here, mm -hmm. but you know, it's basically not status quo, but not ridiculous. Yeah. So Duncan, <laughs> let us, uh, let, let's talk about the finale of this. Now that yeah. I express my initial concerns, right? So and what I find interesting as well is we've made many, many, jokes tonight about things coming full circle and uh, this final episode is called 
full circle as yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, this one's directed by Nelson McCormick, by the way. I, I'm not familiar. Did you ever see the shitty Prom Night remake? Oh, uh, did I? I don't know that I did. I did. Then God bless your cotton socks if you didn't. It's, it, it is very forgettable, but yeah, he did that. Uh, wow, so, that's a step up. Well, he's done a shitload of TV since, and what I'm going to say is he's worked on some incredible TV shows. He's done some incredible TV. He did that, that first episode of Daredevil as well oh wow yeah that was yeah so he he needs to stick in this lane the tv lane and never go back to making movies like prom night (laughs) yeah uh, you know that may not have been his fault that could have been Uh, he did another one as well what was it he did another horror remake which was fucking equally as bad uh i will find it well the stepfather which is not a good remake yeah i didn't see that one yeah so i'm just gonna see some people are, are best saved for making awesome TV, of which this guy has done. Like 24, Southland, he did Boss, which I loved, Nashville, Daredevil, um, he did some stuff on The Good Way, Prison Break, Homeland, you know, that's like, I love Lovecraft Country. So I'm, what I'm going to say is, the dude's done a lot of TV, stick to doing TV, dude. Fair enough. Uh, so we begin at the Travel mm-hmm. Guide office. Uh, yes. with D well on her way to being cursed, uh, or like yeah. being completely consumed by it. And so they're, they're like, all right, we got to open this book. Tick reads the words that were given to him on the, on the paper. And the book opens up, uh, flips to a page of its own volition. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is a page that displays Tick's birthmark. And before they can really like register what's going on, uh, Tick and Letty just pass the fuck out. Yep, drop to the floor like a couple of sacks of potatoes. <laughs> right, and it's like, well, that was unexpected. And yeah, a couple of sacks of shog off potatoes, boy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they're oh, they're delicious. Uh, <laughs> kind of a casserole. Anyway, so <laughs> t- Tick's back in the burning manner, the of mm-hmm. the the Braithwaite manner, uh, just like the dream he has of Hannah. Only now she stops at the doorway and says. The answer is in your blood. And, <laughs> hey, I bet you're wondering how we got here. Yeah. And so then we move over to Letty, who is in the 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 Tulsa house, the family house yeah. there. And you see flames going on outside the windows. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's pretty neat. And the, like, Grandma Spooky is there. <laughs> and I bet you thought I was dead. <laughs> yeah. I've come to curse you. Uh, no, she says, you let me burn. I thought holding on to you would make me invulnerable too. I gambled and lost. That'd be a cruel curse, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, but no, she says, uh, the one that you carry brought you here. Mm-hmm. And it was a real, like, you know, you opened the book, we came. <laughs> Except they're like the... The nicest oh, cheap and hit. Yeah, but they're like the nicest Cenobites ever, like Cenacuddles. Yeah. Cenacuddles. <laughs> and she's like, it's time to regain what's been lost. <laughs> and <laughs> Oh no, tears, sweet child. Here have a comforter. And a hot water bottle. Here, have some warm cuckoo. That's right. <laughs> this is Pinhead making his return voice. I told you I would be back. No longer auditioning for the sounds of racist police officer. I have returned as spooky grandmother. Yes. And another dimension here to give you semi cuddles. Yes. Yes, I have. I will leave now because this show is running long. <laughs> but bye, everyone. Until the next Duncan and Bo come correct season when obnoxious tired pinhead makes his return bye (laughs) do you need a ride for to the airport (laughs) remember and tip your waiter yes 15 percent if he has done a good job i have to go help a friend move (laughs) tonight is babysitting i am the designated driver um, so I love, it. I love everything that's happening. Considerate Pinhead might be the next character to make a, a regular appearance here. Yes. So 
Uh, Hannah. <laughs> You're a bad man. Uh. <laughs> So we cut back over to Hannah, who kind of tells her story where she was like, yeah, yeah, I, you know, I took off and I, I took the, the book with me and I, I used a spell, which is where we got the birthmark from, that mm-hmm. hides our whole bloodline from other people who use magic. And uh, then we cut over the old woman and she's like, hey, when Hannah first opened this book, she basically created what we are in now, which is this ancestral space. And she first thought it was hell and then cut back to Hannah. Who's like, I just thought it was hell, but yeah. <laughs> like an old couple that are yeah. talking about their holiday. And then I said, no, I don't want another beer. I, did, didn't I say that? Yeah. She said yeah. she didn't want another beer. So I didn't have another beer. And then it's, it's so delightful. I want remember this as well. So where she's like, if you're going to learn one spell from this book, the one that hides your family bloodline is a thumping good one to come out with. You know what not, I mean? <laughs> not, look, I, as far as I'm concerned, Ain't shabby. Hannah's doing just fine with magic. She's got <laughs> she's, a... <laughs> Tell me she's got an aptitude for this book. Yeah. So she tells Atticus, like, you know, at first all I felt here was this pain of the fire, but then I realized that that was my anger. Mm-hmm. And uh, all I had to do was learn how to tame it. And once I I made this a a safe space, I realized that this magic was not a thing that we had to fear, but Mm -hmm. it was a gift that we need to pass on. And meanwhile, the old lady is like, yeah, she thought this shit was the devil's tools for a while. And she was really (laughs) afraid of it. And don't be her Letty. Don't, don't fuck her. Like, don't pretend that this is all, Oh, it's the devil's magic and, and, and do all this bullshit. Uh, and not use magic because magic is is what's going to save us. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're now the old woman is telling Letty like you are now in charge of protecting this book. And she's like, I don't know. What about Atticus? And she's like, ep, 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 ep. <laughs> Atticus has his own bullshit to worry about. The book is you. You're on. He book is here. he is getting a similar speech in a different room right now. Yeah, he is. Yeah, right. The, uh, we're double teaming him in the other room. Uh, we're good co- we're good ghost bad ghosting this. <laughs> Eventually she'll come talk to you. I'm gonna go talk to him. Uh, she comes in and she's like, you know, hey, Letty. Fucking knock it off. You gotta you gotta get to work. I'm the nice one. Uh, so <laughs> uh, there's a there's a great one wo- uh, moment here where Atticus tells Hannah like, hey, I unbound this book to save D. What, what, you know, did I screw up? And she goes, oh, you're going to save them all. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, shit. All right. <laughs> um, so then Atticus is now in Montrose's apartment. And there are flames outside the window here, too, which looks real rocket. It looks, it's like an Alice Cooper's weekend house. And, <laughs> <laughs> and he... Then his mother comes out of the kitchen and Mm -hmm. there's this moment, man, where they sit down on the couch and Tick just puts his head in her lap and he starts crying Mm -hmm. and he goes, I don't want to die, mama. It's, oh, it tugs at the old heartstrings, Duncan. (laughs) And, and, but his mother is like, look, we're all going to die. We're all marching to a sacrifice, she says, but it's what Mm -hmm. you sacrifice yourself for that matters. And she says, look, Hannah's spell is going to change everything. It's going to be a beginning, not an end. And also, let me tell you about this crazy three-way I have in mind with George and Montrose. (laughs) And he's like, what the fuck? And she's like, no, no, no. I mean, they were part of my soul. And I should have been scared of that. But also, have you thought about polygamy? And he's like, mom, now is not (laughs) the time for any of this. (laughs) And... (laughs) And she says, no, 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 you're the best. Have you ever looked into Mormonism? (laughs) Yeah. You know, have you ever swung as in to swing? (laughs) (laughs) I've seen you swing a bat, but have you swung a set of car keys in a bowl at a party? I got you, kid. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Thank you. Oh, but... 
she actually she says a really nice thing here where she says you're actually the best of both of them you're you've got montrose's fierce heart and you've got george's integrity and that mm-hmm. and that's what makes you so special and so then we cut over to letty who is practicing this spell with uh old grandpa weirdo and tick and his mom enter and there's a nice one where letty is like is that your fucking mother um <laughs> hello nice to meet you i guess i'm letty um yeah yes this child is out with wedlock <laughs> yikes um <laughs> and they, before they can kind of do introductions and stuff they, they're all just like there's fucking work to do like we look we're on the ghost schedule here we, we can't <laughs> we can't sit around and just jabber jaw all day this is the season finale we've got some shit to do right yeah. come on let's get this moving yeah uh, look i didn't realize we were doing a ghost reunion in the first 10 minutes but here we are and so they start this spell, but before they do it, there's this really nice moment where Tick is, he looks at his mom and then he just hugs her like a child. Mm. You know, it's this quick, like I'm burying my face against you. It is, it's such a childish thing, but then he lets her go and he gets up and he's like, all right, we got to do this chant shit. And they start this spell in the ghost world. Mm-hmm. And while they're doing that, um, there's uh, a, like a, a cloud of flies and shit that is forming there as they're they're chanting. And meanwhile, back in the non-spirit world, like Hippolyta and Montrose and everybody are like, hey, wake the fuck up. You've got to save me. <laughs> yeah, not now. You just opened the fucking book. Not now. Right. You got the book up. Did it kill you? What happened? And then Hippolyta looks over and is like, hey, these getting better. Mm-hmm. and then you know we cut back to the spirit world and they you know kind of dispel this cloud of flies and then back in the real world d opens her eyes up along with tick and letty who wake up too mm-hmm. and letty immediately is like i need a pen and paper somebody give me a pen and paper right now i got go <laughs> shit <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i got go shit to remember and it don't last long uh I I sorry I hit the gunge before I showed up. I didn't re- I didn't know I was going to be taking ghost dictation. I've got one of the telling things here is that when D wakes up, she is restored minus her arm, which is still all crispy critter. Yeah, and she wakes up screaming, Duncan, as yep. well she should. She wakes up. Yes, if anyone's if anyone's earned that scream, it's D. Right, she wakes up in mortal terror, and you're like, oh, she is not okay. Not only is the arm bad, but like D's head is not right. Um, mm-hmm. So then Montrose is uh, having a moment with Letty where he's asking her like, hey, you, it would help if you talk some sense into Atticus. He's thinking about killing himself. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> and Atticus is uh, like, look, Hannah has been working on this spell for a century. And this plan is going to protect our entire family. And does a nice rundown of like, look, we have dealt with monsters, ghosts, a magical treasure hunt, the past, <laughs> the future, multiverses, Shagos, and and he's like, we are not running now. We are mm. at the finale of this show. No, sir. <laughs> Bo has some concerns that we might do this run at the end, and I am here to tell Bo we are not. Bo, are you happy? And Bo's like, yep, yeah, I'm happy. So, so, Great, let's let's so far, so move good. on. Yeah, and and, uh, Atticus says, look, my death is just one possible future, but we've got to take this opportunity to use Extina's magic against her. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, the song Ready or Not by Highland Park Collective and Jizzle plays. Yes, it's great. And Letty and Tick suit up, take a moment to kind of calm down the pet shagoth they've got hidden in the basement. (laughs) just growling down there and they're like hey be cool buddy you're gonna you'll, you'll get some screen time <laughs> but shall it be awesome screen time it's gonna be good screen time just calm down okay, then. all right and so then they take the you're gonna it's gonna be a haircut um so they take the elevator down into the you know the catacombs and shit uh below the boarding house mm-hmm. and there's in the elevator they're alone for a minute and letty kind of puts her head on uh atticus shoulders and they just hold hands for a second 
and it's nice to have this kind of quiet moment for these characters i think yeah because it it ain't quiet after this scene (laughs) right like everything's about to pop off and so they're they uh go to this uh sort of central hub of these passages where there's yes this is where they drop down when the when they were in the uh, museum Right, and they drop down to, to the 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 room with many doors. Yeah, so, the, uh, so technically they, when this they're would back be, here. Yeah, Chicago, I guess, is where yes, they are. Yes, yes, so yeah, they're back at the back in the basement. So. And uh, and and so they're like doing a supernatural style circle of salt, and uh, Tick is you know casting this spell, and what they end up doing is conjuring old Titus Braithwaite, <laughs> old racist himself, right? And 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 Hannah also. Uh, yes. It turns out, and and Braithwaite is like, what "The fuck are you doing here?" Like I was, <laughs> the, the hell's going on? What the, what are you people doing? And <laughs> Hannah, uh, or Atticus and Letty both try to stab him, and he's like, yeah. "The fuck!" And then he takes off, like does a ghost dash, <laughs> yeah. and, and gets out of the circle and shows up right in front of Extina's car. Yeah, which makes her skid right. <laughs> fucking we it yeah into a fucking utility pole yeah sending her through the windshield which is pretty rocking mm. and she gets up because she's invulnerable she gets up and is like ruby you cool and ruby's like uh yeah my bell got rung but uh what the hell happened but titus is now gone he's trying to say to her yeah he's, they've he's, got he's the book of words. they've got the book yeah they've got the book of names is what yeah, he's book of names. Say, but but he gets sucked <laughs> back before he can finish the sentence yeah. And he's just like, God damn it, you guys. Yeah. What the fuck is going on? And then they all. The winning lotto numbers are three, seven, ten, and. A... Yeah. <laughs> What's and... the final number? <laughs> so they just pile on this dude. Like it, it's all the ancestors now. It's like Hannah and Dora and, and Grandma Creepy. And they're all there, like piling on Titus Braithwaite. And yeah. uh, Atticus gets a knife and carves a big chunk of flesh out of Mm -hmm. Braithwaite. And then Letty and Tick chant and dispel not only Braithwaite, but all the spirits of their ancestors too. Dora last, his mother last. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and then when it's done, Letty says, that was supposed to be the easy part. Yeah. I was like, yikes. Yeah. (laughs) So... (laughs) <laughs> and and so then we cut to uh hippolyta who is bringing d some food uh because d is again not having a great time lately no. um having having a bad couple of weeks and is all moody in bed and stuff and by the way the pecan pie in particular that hippolyta brings her look pretty good I, um, yeah, I mean, as a, a connoisseur and creator of of, of pies myself, um, I like to I like to think that I have a keen eye for a good pie, Bo, and I'll tell you right now, I would smash that pie mm. with my face. Oh, with your face, I was thinking. Yeah, not with my dick, no. Yeah, I, I would do either. Uh, <laughs> my my soon-to-be seven dicks after the, after the COVID medicine. Yeah. Um, I, I go a number of ways with pies, but I'm pie curious. Oh, boy, you're welcome, still... ladies and gentlemen. Oh, tip your waitress. Still... Good night. So, <laughs> uh, Hippolyta though is like, "Hey, uh, D, I know you're mad at me, and I left you, but I did it so I could become the woman that you always imagined me to be." Look at my blue hair; it's fucking lush. Yeah. Do you see this hair? How rad this is. Mm-hmm. And. She says, look, I was always coming back. And if I'd known what was happening to you, I would have come back sooner. And he's like, fuck you and fuck that. I was alone. I don't care what you were going to do or what Mm -hmm. you should have done or would have done. I got fucked up and cursed. And you couldn't have done shit about it if you were here anyway. So, you know, all I know is that there is magic out there now. I got cursed by it and fucked up and I don't control any part of my life great great and you and yes thank you for the peanut butter and jelly in light of all that (laughs) oh i will eat this pie Mm. (laughs) oh yeah oh that makes my arm non-withered and (laughs) has restored the moments where i was chased by nightmarish creatures 
and you were fucking gone wherever you were. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, she is not pleased, Duncan. No, I, I, I'm going to say, I, hashtag I'm with her. Yeah, hashtag I'm with D. Yeah, um, I'm with D. <laughs> and Letty takes... Hashtag D2. Yeah. yeah. Uh... D2, the mighty Shagoths. Uh, oh, okay, you just hold that. <laughs> so Letty, Tick, and Montrose are debating how they're going to get a piece of Extina, which they mm -hmm. need for this spell. And Letty's like, we can get Ruby to do it. And Tick's like, I don't know. And he's like, look, the only people we can count on are the three of us. And then Hippolyta comes in. It's like, four motherfuckers. And he's like, all right, <laughs> Look right. at my blue hair. I'm looking fabulous. And then... Because she does every scene with that blue hair and with that. I have never considered having blue hair, but if it looked like that, I would fucking have it. Yeah. It, it, again, incredibly rad. Mm. And so then Extina shows up. <laughs> Brilliant. And she's like, hey, Atticus, can we talk? And he's like, look, whatever you you want to say to me, you can say in front of all these people. And she's like, look, I know because of a ghost who wrecked my car that you guys have the book of names. So you give it to me and I'm going to leave you and your whole family alone. And Atticus is like, no. Yeah. And she's like, uh, what? And he's like, no. You can't have it. Get the fuck out. And she's like, fine. And on her way out, she removes Letty's invulnerability. Mm -hmm. And so now it's like, hey, you, if you guys want to play hardball, look, Extina can play hardball. Yeah. The stakes just got oh so much more interesting. Right. So our heroes then enter the boarding house where, by the way, they see a black family moving in across the street. Yeah, the times that are changing, Bull Runs, though. Yeah, like all the pioneering worked, right? Like it, it, it is becoming an integrated neighborhood. And if you build it, Bo, they will come. I brought over a welcome basket. <laughs> this is who I, this is who I was helping to move earlier on in the scene when I said I had to leave. Yes, hello, Ron. Hello, Judy. <laughs> nice to see you again. I I hope the the unpacking doesn't take. Uh, six months. I know how you are about leaving boxes around, Ron. Anyway, um, I'll, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back to tear souls apart soon, but uh, for now. Ron, I see you that you're laughing, but you know me too well. These chains have got a hooking. <laughs> uh, yes. uh, I am, I'm Pinhead. I'm leaving this scene again, I promise. <laughs> yeah. I may return. Maybe. Judy, sorry about Chatterbox and the Crackers. He gets them everywhere. Can't resist a Ritz, though, can you, Chatterbox? <laughs> Bye, Ron and Judy. Chat Chatterbox sitting in the back eating pumpkin seeds. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like shells going everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. You know, Clyde Barker does have the rights to Hellraiser back, and if he decides that's what I want to do with it, I'm there. Totally fine. If <laughs> Hellraiser settling, settling down in the suburbs. <laughs> um anyway so atticus oh. calls up the drake hotel which is where gia is staying who apparently is just hanging out in town after being humiliated by uh her ex-boyfriend in her her uh, humiliated by her ex-boyfriend in her ex-boyfriend's new girlfriend's place yeah which is raw she does she does have a, a kind of amazing scene though <laughs> when yeah. that guy tries to hammer yeah he, yeah he, she, this dude sits down and like so all alone lady and and she whips out some korean on him and, and he goes you must not speak english <laughs> and she says i said would you be willing to die to fuck me yeah and he's like uh i'm gonna go over there you're <laughs> <laughs> a little weird, lady. A little dark. Yeah. She's just saying that you should put her pussy on a pedestal, bull, and I'm with it. Yeah. You, you tell him, Gia. Put a ring on it. Yeah. On her vagina. So after he leaves, Tick shows up, and he apologizes for going all hereditary on her the first time I yeah. saw her. <laughs> <laughs> this is my I house. Am, I, yeah, I am your former. I am your former lover. Don't you ever fucking swear at me. Yeah, right. 
Oh god damn that's still still the rawest argument I've ever seen in a movie. Yeah, it's it's, it's one of those arguments that we're just like, yeah, I've I've seen a version of this before, and yeah, I wish the couch would now swallow me. So mm. I don't love this. Yeah, it's awkward. Yeah, it's 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 <laughs> memorable. So mm. Gia is like, you know, I I thought I wasn't a monster because I was starting to feel things for the sexy lady nurse back in Korea, and then you. And then even, you know, the woman who was my mother was starting to warm up to me some. Uh, mm-hmm. But then she died and then, you know, you disappeared. And I, I just, I don't know if I was imagining these emotions. And Tig is just like, oh, girl, you just grieving. Yep. And he, and he says the, uh, like, hey, you're the one who taught me we can either be monsters or we can be heroes. And and has this speech about like, hey, we're we're kind of family. We have these intertwined destinies, and if that doesn't make us family, I don't know what does. So you know, you're not alone, and and you can you can stand by our side, and uh, and you know the the hatchets are buried and whatnot. So after making up with Gia, uh, Ruby it goes to their mother's grave. Uh, she and Letty's mother's. Uh, grave and letty is there as well and letty confesses to ruby in this moment that she was uh she was actually in jail for her mother's funeral which is why she didn't come something that they argued about way back in the uh, first couple of episodes mm-hmm. and, tying another oh, tying up those loose ends boy can you feel those loose ends being tied yeah there, there are a couple <sighs> that are created here but we'll get to that yeah um, <laughs> and uh, Letty is like, you know, I, I gotta be honest with you. I was kind of relieved when I found out that I was going to be in jail for her funeral. And Ruby is like, you think I want to go? They, like it sucked, but you know, if that's what family is. And Letty's like, you know, it doesn't have to like, it, it. it's not really about obligation. It can be about something more. And I understand that now in a way I never did. And what I need from you, from my sister is, is you to not only be my sister, but to be my family. And uh, I need this thing from Extina, who is going to kill Atticus. And Ruby is like, look, I know what you think you sound like, but... Oh, but I'm, I'm just going to say I'm with Ruby on this, because like she does literally just say, you know... Like family's more important than all the rest, and I understand that now, and I'm not using anyone or whatnot. And then the first thing she says is, "I need this from you." Yeah, so yeah. I'm, it, I'm with Ruby. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm with. I, I agree. I like. I think Ruby is totally right about this. Mm-hmm. But I also like. I don't think Letty is trying to manipulate her or anything. I think Letty is completely honest, and I think yeah, she, I think she's. This is the first time she's actually asking for something honestly from her sister. Yeah, but it's like the boy that cried wolf. She's done it so many times for ulterior motives that when it finally comes to a genuine moment, of course her sister is going to look at it with a high degree of cynicism. Right, and Ruby starts to take off, and before she can get away, Letty says, "Look, that's not everything." And we don't really know exactly what she told Ruby here, but I assume it's about like, Hey, I'm pregnant. (laughs) And you know, by the way, uh, and so we cut back to D. Oh, I love this scene so much. (laughs) So D is like scribbling in this book and she's pissed off because she can't draw with her offhand. And while she's kind of angrily scribbling, Hippolyta slips an Arithia Blue comic under the door that mm-hmm. she, she's never seen before. And D like opens it up and it's you know, this really uh stylish, colorful art and and that kind of thing. And it's uh it's her adventures, it's uh Hippolyta's adventures on this planet that was inspired by Arithia Blue. Mm-hmm. And Hippolyta comes in and D says, how did you learn to draw like this? And Hippolyta says, a woman named uh, Afua taught me mm-hmm. or Afua uh, taught me. And she is actually referencing here. Duncan, do you know this fact? This little I tidbit? do know this fact. The only reason I know this fact is in advance to D doing a little bit of research on finding out if this season had been extended or not. You know, had they, you know, granted a season two or whatnot. This was in one of the the facts specifically, one of the cool facts that they mentioned, well, the article I read, um, 
had mentioned that this is a comic book artist who does exist that does Marvel stuff. Is that right? She's done some Marvel stuff, uh, done some of her original stuff, was actually in a hip hop band for a while. Amazing. Uh, and But she also did all of the art that you see drawn in Lovecraft Country. Mm-hmm. So she is the official Lovecraft Country artist, and it's such a sweet. It like it's it, it's like the thing with the book almost of like yeah. Hey, when we're doing the difference of the timelines, oh, the difference is actually the book. Then her saying like, oh, an artist named Afua taught me, like oh, this artist from the future that Hippolyta learned from, who is actually the artist that does all the show stuff. It's just yeah. one of those things. Very of clever. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're just like, man, I, I love how much this show loves the people who work on this show, mm-hmm. you know, and are just like, yeah, I don't know. It seems like it's a, a really wonderful environment for artists, like actors and, and comic artists and musicians and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, like this show does such an amazing job of kind of pulling from so many different mediums, whether it's, you know, music or spoken word or poetry or visual arts or whatever. Like it, it, it kind of gets all these different uh, influences and, and, and pulls them into the show and being able to just outright acknowledge somebody mm-hmm. on screen, like forever that artist is going to be like, Oh yeah, that's the episode where they just call me out by name. Yeah. You know, that's, I, cool. I love it. I love it. I love it. Anyway, so um, D says, I'm never going to draw again. And then Hippolyta is like, tell you what, let me show you something. <laughs> and this is where she's kind of taken D down the hallway and says, people think a time is something physical, but that's just in your mind like so many things. It's not a physical thing, but people tend to get stuck in moments even though time keeps moving. And she's like, look, I let you down. You have every right to be mad at me, but I'm going to make sure that this moment passes and that you are going to draw again. And Dia's like, how are you going to do that? And then Hippolyta just opens a door and you don't <laughs> see anything, but you hear- Not until the end of this episode. And <laughs> trust me, when you see it, the payoff is fucking worth the wait. <laughs> but you hear all this like bubbling and machinery and shit. Mm-hmm. And D is like, whoa. And that's so that's all you see of this. Uh, yes. You don't get to see the lab. Um, <laughs> the lab. That's my uh, uh, Rocky Horror pronunciation. It's very good. Thank you. Um, so Ruby go- goes to visit uh, Extina in the lab. Um, <laughs> and she is teaching Ruby, like, you know, look, if you want to make magic, it's body and intention and all that stuff. And. Uh, she's telling stories about like the first potion she ever did. And mm-hmm. she's like, I had to use blood and hair and fingernails and some mincies. And that's gross. And, but she puts a vial, uh, on the table and, and, um, when she puts it down, Ruby's eyes kind of flit to the vial. And Xena is like, is there something wrong with you? And she says, uh, Ruby says, nah, I'm just, I'm thinking, um, what are you worried that the spell's not going to work? And Ixian says, well, if the spell doesn't work, then I will have killed the very last of my family for nothing. Yeah. And Ruby says, you know what? The spell is going to work and you've got me now. And then they kiss. Mm. And Ixina is, uh, asks her, Hey, have you ever done this with a lady before? And Ruby is like, uh, no, first time which is of course a callback to i'm gonna have a lifetime of firsts yep so while they're getting down tick goes to get baptized at a church with letty Mm -hmm. and she tells him like god's gonna protect us he's uh, he's gonna protect you uh and and atticus is like yeah i wish i believed that that's not really my bag and she's like no 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 god's in all of us it's around us it moves through us (laughs) and... <laughs> believe <laughs> yeah and and they you know they kiss and it's just this nice little moment but i think this is one of those threads because it doesn't there's not a ton of payoff to this and i think there's there's something about the baptism that's going to come up in a second season perhaps i think you're right so Meanwhile, I don't mind that though. That's being introduced in this episode. I'm talking about long-standing things that you've been teasing like a motherfucker. And we get to this oh, last of course. episode, and you're like, 
Oh, but wait. <laughs> oh, no, this is not a complaint. Don't get me yeah. wrong. Um, and, and so I am blessed by Nina Simone plays. Yes, it's a great chin. While Atticus, he, he's like straightening the uh, travel agency sign at the window. And he turns around and he sees this panorama of Montrose and Hippolyta and D and Letty. Uh, all these people that he loves and who love him working together and 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 this is it like our our team is about to hit the road and yep. and so he says let's do it people and they pack everyone into woody but before they can leave ruby shows up and she's got a, a vial of blood and letty and ruby hug and she ends up tagging along for this trip yep so uh, along the way, there's a moment where they all sing "Shaboom" in the in the car. Another nice, yeah, little which I've just suddenly realized that, that links back to our <laughs> a bit conversation earlier on. Yeah, oh mon dieu, I do have drinks in cognac. Yeah, <laughs> right. And and so we we oh, make our okay. our yes, we make our way to Artem, and mm-hmm. Montrose is uh, doing this like salt bit again while Atticus. Uh, has to eat the flesh of of Titus Braithwaite that he cut off, and then he chases it down with some Extina blood. Mm. Montrose, by the way, completely grossed out by all of this. Yeah, he just tells him to hold his nose and get it down. <laughs> yeah, it gives him a little <laughs> bit of liquid courage to get it down. And uh, and then he's like, I'll see you on the other side. Mm-hmm. And Tick then approaches the wreckage of Braithwaite Manor. And the villagers from Resident Evil 4 surround him. (laughs) (laughs) While while Letty and Ruby are up in this stone tower silo deal, drawing symbols on the walls and whatnot, and uh, and saying like, hey, you know, we're going to have to get this done before uh extina starts the the ritual so we can do this binding spell and so montrose has has got like poured salt all the way to the bridge Mm -hmm. and is there like giaz with him and uh letty shows up here or no not letty uh who is it it's gia montrose i thought somebody else was with him hippolyta hippolyta is with him right um, and Ruby then says to Letty up in the tower, she says, you know, despite everything, it was a really nice trip. And I think I finally understand the pull of family for the first time. Mm-hmm. And Letty's like, the fuck? And Duncan's like, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> the penny just dropped again. <laughs> yeah. So Letty starts to catch wise and she goes, thanks for agreeing to help at the cemetery like you did. Mm. And Ruby's like, oh, of course, you're my sister. And you're mm. like, oh, shit, that ain't Ruby. Um, so before we get the inevitable throwdown, Montrose, G.I., and Hippolyta are being surrounded by these same Resident Evil 4 villagers. And they start <laughs> fighting. Meanwhile, Letty and Ruby go at it in this fucking tower. Yep. And Christina, now having the body of Ruby, who is a big and imposing lady fucks letty up yeah she is she is punching letty like a guy in the face like holding her shoulder and just bam bam like working her picking her up and throwing her just letty doesn't stand a goddamn chance Mm -hmm. and ultimately ruby just picks her up and throws her out the goddamn window yeah just throws her right off the top yeah and letty falls down and like I'm like, oh, did she just kill Lay? Yeah. Question mark. Falls onto the ground, blood trickling out of her mouth, unmoving. There you go. Mm-hmm. And so um, we cut to D in a car reading Lovecraft Country, the book. Yep. And starting to hear some shit going on outside. Uh, so, uh oh, it is nightfall and the Shoggoths are now loose in the woods too. Yeah, the, the, you're in Shoggoth wood. <laughs> yeah. So, and and so everyone else has been on the bridge has been captured. Um, Atticus is strapped down to this, you know, semi crucifix kind of thing. Yeah. While Exena shows up in her about to be a goddess gown. <laughs> it's difficult to get, you know, but uh, once you, once you have a good uh, good dressmaker, it's um, hot. 
it's it's a lot and and so (laughs) she says you know for what it's worth hijacking that spell idea pretty good plan it probably would have worked if you had left ruby out of it Mm -hmm. and then atticus asks where letty is and she doesn't say anything but she has that look yeah she had to take an unexpected trip (laughs) she'll be here next fall Mm. Yep, <laughs> I I hated to let her down. <laughs> <laughs> She's doing the laundry on tumble. <laughs> it's real dumb. So Tick like freaks out because he he understands that something has happened to Letty, and yep. and Exina is just like, let's get this party started, and. Then we see a Shoggoth start to attack D's car. Yeah. But then, Duncan, <laughs> our pet Shoggoth shows up too and starts fucking those Shoggoths up. <laughs> Shoggoth gets seen? Yeah. Hey! <laughs> Ruh, <This> Roll! Skip- <laughs> our Shoggoth is voiced by Skippy D, yeah. isn't he? Ruh, Roll, D. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> it's, it's, it's like these that I realize how ridiculous we actually are as <laughs> I really do. It makes me so proud and so happy, but at the same time <laughs> I love everything there, that's happening right now. <laughs> yes, there uh, I have no problems with anything that we are saying. <laughs> I stand behind it 100%. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, while, while <laughs> Shuby is, <laughs> is is wrestling with the other Shagaths, um, this blue song called Keep Your Lamps Trimmed and Burning plays. Oh, man. And oh, it, yeah. Extina is like chanting, and then she just whips open Tick's arms. Oh yeah, just right into the artery, right along the uh, nice vein line, right, and she is getting her blood magic on. Yeah, she's bathing in a large amount of blood that Tick is losing. Yeah. One might call an alarming amount of blood. Yeah, at this point, Bo, I was starting to think that maybe, maybe, maybe Tick wasn't going to survive this. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, again, I was like, all right, they're going to cook up some crazy shit. Like, she, her, her, the energy she's taken from him is going to go back into him, something like that. Yep. So, um, anyway, while energy from Atticus is kind of blasting her, Letty wakes up and her un- invulnerability mark is back. Oh, yeah. On, on, don't know how or why, just is. So, Atticus then is aware enough to see Letty show up kind of in the back of the room Mm -hmm. and he kind of half smiles and she whispers to him, I love you. And then he just sags in the restraints. Yeah. It's the, it's the, she whispers. I was just thinking like when you were mentioning there, how inappropriate would, would have been in, And a new hope if, like, just before Obi Wan Kenobi was struck with that lightsaber, if he'd done the same look, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> that look of kind of longing and sadness and love, and I love you. <laughs> Show the lightsaber. Only, <laughs> only a master of love, Darth. <laughs> my brain's broken it really is <laughs> so oh. Letty then stabs <laughs> Extina and, and starts like you know chanting uh, a spell and Extina is like look I'm immortal now this is stupid <laughs> and Hippolyta and Gia are, are like going after Montrose and, and uh, trying to get him on his feet and then Hippolyta is like, ah, oh, this isn't going to work because their bodies have to be connected. Mm-hmm. And Gia's like, connected, you say? <laughs> I don't know if you knew this about me, but I have furry sex tentacles that come out and, and connect shit. Mostly to me. Yeah. But <laughs> I think I can connect that white lady with that dude. Mm-hmm. And so, 
So, and that's what she does. Like the, the furry sex tentacles come out of her eyes. One goes around Extina, one goes into uh tick. And this is where I was like, Oh, well this is where he comes back to life. Right. Yeah. And there's a whole magical explosion that happens during this connection because Letty is chanting like this is the spell to uh to the binding spell that we've been hearing so much about. Mm-hmm. And so Extina comes to uh and she's still kind of chanting, but she's fucked up and she's trapped under this collapsed wall. Uh, yet another wall that has fallen in the ruins of Braithwaite Manor. <laughs> That's just not a solid structure, bro. Yeah, and and so as she's chanting she says oh you've bound me from magic and oh duncan letty is like not just you every white person in the world i mean it's the buffy it's the buffy end and and i kind of fucking love it yeah right? is this the but is that like like what, what i wanted was a montage of black people all over in the world you know just starting to realize that they have magic too yeah um and it didn't do it, and I'm fine with it not doing it, but it is the Buffy ending, which, like I say, like, that's one of my favourite endings in TV, because it's, just, like, such a, like, a massive fucking... This is... You, you remember the show that's ran on for so long, and you wondered how we were going to finish it? This is how we finish it. And, oh, by the way, it's better than you ever imagined it would be. Right. And I was like, yes, yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, we're going we're gonna to end with a giant fucking crater. Um... <laughs> So yeah, yeah. She basically, like, has not only protected the family for good, but protected the family from any white person that would ever want to do any fucking harm using this this magic power. It's gone. Yeah, Exina, like, you doomed not only your entire family by murdering them to get your ultimate dreams, but yeah, guess what? You also doomed your entire race of white people, <laughs> bitch. Yeah, it, Sorry, and Letty, I was so fucking happy when they said this. I was like, in your face, Christina. When Letty says, magic is ours now. Yeah. It's just like, God damn it, this show is so good. And then, yeah. <laughs> then it turns on a dime, because that's this really great triumphant moment of like, not only did we beat our villain, we have changed the stakes dramatically. Forever. Yeah. And then we cut over to Montrose. Who is yeah, trying is... to wake up Atticus. And he's doing and... that. Come on. Get up. Quit fooling around. Wake up. Come on, Atticus. Get up. And then there's the realization of, no, he's he's gone. Yeah. And so there's a note that mm-hmm. is is given to, to Montrose here. Uh, where he kind of starts off kind of quoting Count of Monte Cristo. And uh, uh, here's the whole thing. It's pretty short. It says, Dear Pop, I hope you'll forgive me for this one last secret. I know you wouldn't accept it, but it had to be done to protect our family, to protect us all. There is neither happiness nor misery in the world. There is only the comparison of one state with another. Nothing more. He who has felt the deepest grief is best able to experience supreme happiness. Recognize that? Dumas' wise words are my wish for you. Supreme happiness. Teach my son new ways of living instead of repeating what we've been through. As little George's grandfather, you have a second chance to be the father you always wanted. Don't waste it. Love, Tick. And so this is Tick's, assumedly, last words. Yeah. Yeah to uh to his father it is really sweet it's really touching um and then we get a bit of an epilogue and and we like this is being read as letty and montrose and and hippolyta uh are are carrying his body out on on a stretcher they're just his dead body in their hands carrying him out of the rubble and then we have a little epilogue, Duncan. <laughs> you said a little epilogue. It's the best fucking epilogue that's ever been shot in TV history. <laughs> and so... I want... This is a whole... Like a whole show. <laughs> I mean, that... I mean, isn't that... The, yes. Uh, so, anyway. So, Xena <laughs> is trapped under this rubble where mm-hmm. they just left her there to die, which I respect. I'm just like, well, you know. <laughs> and so, D shows up with Shuby. <laughs> Which should be. Raro, D. <laughs> and she is trapped. 
And uh, Extina looks at D and is like, hey, can you help me, D? I mean, I kind of reset that curse and all. Come on, D. And D says, apparently to Shuby, mm-hmm. says, they still haven't learned. And then reveals her robot arm, Duncan. She's got a our robot arm. She's got a robot Terminator, arm. Our, our Terminator fucking robot arm. And I was like, oh, oh. She's the one who gave him the book. She has a robot arm. <laughs> so excited. So excited. So excited. So excited. And then <laughs> she takes said robot arm, wraps it around Extina's throat, and starts choking her. Oh yeah, and you're like, oh, she's gonna just choke this bitch to death, nay nay, because <laughs> she's got a robot arm. She just rips her throat out. Yeah, out, oh. and then Extina ain't coming back, <laughs> and wipes it on Extina before she's done. Wipes the <laughs> uh, the blood from her throat on her dead body. Yes, yeah, uh, you know, Shuby <laughs> roars against the backdrop of the moon. Yes. Duncan comes harder than he's ever came in his entire life. Like, like, like I hit the, I hit the back wall. Um, you know, I hit the door. I it went over the fence and into next door's garden, which took a lot of explaining the following day. Um, but it was worth it all. Yeah, and I mean that's the end of season one. Is this Shoggoth roaring at the moon while the robot arm D <laughs> and her army of magical black folk? Rule yep. over a world of magicless white people. So when they talked about like, oh, you know, I saw when Tick was talking about, I saw white people rioting. Yeah. I wonder if it's like, hey, the, the like the reason is because suddenly the white people are oppressed. Yeah. I would imagine so. I mean, yeah. that's kind of where my head's at. And if that's what season two is, how soon can it be here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 a uh, let's any well, it's worth saying any fears that you did have surely alleviated by the end of this episode. Yeah, I I just couldn't believe the boldness of it. It's so fucking ballsy. I mean, that's but uh, why are we surprised? This show has been from the very start, like ridiculous. Like, as in, like if I did not know better, <laughs> I I would genuinely think that. You know, there had been some conversation somewhere where Misha Green had sat down with HBO and said, listen, like, you just, like, if I'm going to do this, if we're going to do this with HBO, you have to completely adhere to my vision. No, like, no interference at all, because it is so assured and so confident and, like you say, so ballsy. And it's absolutely 100% not compromised from start to finish. I mean, that ending is jaw-droppingly ballsy. Um, and, yeah, like, that's your, your final shot is, you know, we're, we're still in the past, but we've got robot arms, women uh, like understand the, the multiverse, uh, magic, which is now, you know, like tethered to, to, to black people, um, a, you know, a, a potential future which is going to turn everything that we know about history essentially inside out. Um and like just like a shoggoth roaring against the moon and I like I'm I'm like I'm like you I'm not only why isn't there a season two or when is it coming or or all those things it just kind of makes me think why is it taking this long for TV to be so good <laughs> you know what I mean and really this this season is if you are a genre fan if you just have a passing interest. And TV, which is just not like every fucking other TV show that you've seen. Um, Lovecraft Country rules atop of that roost very, very high. Um, and I, I was struggling. With it. I can't think of a, a single foot they've done wrong out with a little bit of dodgy CGI in one episode. I, I genuinely don't right. think they've put one single foot wrong throughout the entire show. And I can't think of any other TV show that's ever fucking done that. Yeah, it, I mean, it's stunning. I mean, we're talking True Detective Season 1 territory oh, as, yeah, far, yeah. As, as far as, like, being taken as a whole of mm-hmm. what this story is. It's it's big and audacious and, and emotional and satisfying and terrifying and illuminating. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's just one of the best 
first seasons of television I've ever seen. And if they back yeah. it up with anything remotely like a decent season for a season two, I mean, it has all the makings to be one of the the great television shows of all time, and that's yeah. Well, they've, they've, this is them officially finished what was in the first book, and there hasn't been a book since. So wherever they go from now is essentially on them to do it. And like to me, that that essential component is Misha Green. Um, yeah, and as as long as her name is attached to it, I I you know I'm going to go in with all the confidence in all the world, and they need to keep her for this. Uh, or at least have someone she is handpicked as a successor uh, to carry the vision forward. It's fucking great. It's you know it genuinely is incredible TV. I said it before. I will say it again. Had you not picked it for this, um, I don't know when I would have seen this. Just because I'm so far behind on TV these days, I'd probably would have been sometime next year, or the year after. And it's been the most rewarding thing I've seen this year. Uh, yeah, like absolutely stunning. Um, and yeah, roll on that season too. Even if we have to wait two years for it, I, I can wait patiently. Yeah, I, I take your time, get it right. I mean, don't don't tarnish the good name. Like get Matt Ruff in a room with Misha Green, mm-hmm. have the two of them hash it out. Like here's here's the overarching story for season two. Um, you know, if he's got a sequel in mind for his book, then whatever. You know, yeah. make, make make it alongside it, whatever you're going to do. But yeah, it, it's it's tremendous. You know, like it, it's it's really nice when you see something uh, that's this good. You know, it, it, I I think we talked about this on the A24 show a bit about how seeing um, The Witch is so exciting because it's like, oh, one of the best movies I ever saw in my whole life I saw in the past 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's that's refreshing and so now i'm in the enviable place of of saying hey one of the best television shows i've ever seen in my whole life i just i just finished recently you yeah. know um it, yeah it's it's just terrific and and never forgets to be fun you know even oh God, yeah. like that's the thing even when we talk about all the tulsa stuff and and you know certainly we've said it before, but the way that this show handles the whole concept of, of race relations and, and the struggle of black people in the United States uh, of it being so fundamental to what the show is without ever once feeling like it was on a soapbox about anything. Mm -hmm. It's, it just always felt really like honest and, and genuine and not, not, didactic or professorial or anything like that it wasn't ever trying to teach you a lesson the lesson was just there if you wanted to learn it and i it's fuck it's just great it's so good duncan yep <laughs> all right so so the next thing we're gonna do mm-hmm. should we pivot to that do we have anything else to say about lovecraft country for now hey no i think we've covered it uh, if you have for whatever silly reason listened to an entire coverage of this season and not watch the tv show then one you are silly but two there is all the time in the world to go and watch it and i cannot recommend it enough um when it becomes physically available buy it um because we need to do everything in our, our in our power to make sure that that season two happens and all the way it will happen is by people continuing the love and support for it um yeah that's all I, that's all i have to say about lovecraft country uh, and I dare say, I don't think we have to stretch too far here. When season two arrives, they say we'll be covering it, Bo. Let's oh, most see. certainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, magic or no, we will cover it. Mm-hmm. Um, so where are we going next? Like going from the the, the high watermark of, of TV to the high watermark of cinema? Yes. Yeah, so we will be taking a, a, a moment, a, a little bit of a breath to do a, a quick commentary. Mm-hmm. Um, for a movie called Money Plane, <laughs> fucking Money Plane, which which promises to be nonsense. <laughs> Before we tackle like some high quality conceptual TV, yeah, sure. Because w- after we do Money Plane, we're getting back in the saddle with uh, more uh, of this uh, penetrating television analysis. Mm. And, yes, and it's time we turned our laser focus of, of, of scrutiny and and artistic value uh, to the show uh, Slasher. Yes, um, which originally premiered on the on the Chiller Network. 
I have seen two episodes. I, I, I think what you missed was multi-Emmy award-winning Mul- TV show slasher. Yes, one one of the great genre television shows slasher. <laughs> um, I have seen one episode and what I saw was so fucking dumb that my head hurt at the end. Right, the, the whole <laughs> genesis of this is me saying, oh my god, Duncan, have you seen Slasher? It's It's crazy. <laughs> And he watched an episode and was immediately like, we're doing this, right? Like, we're doing Slasher. Yeah, we're, we're doing this, aren't we? That's going to happen. And you were like, yep. And and so, right, as we've talked about on this show, David Cronenberg will be in the newest season of Slasher. God only knows when we'll get to that. But it, it's there at the end of the rainbow. Yeah, and, yeah. And, well, we will work our way up to it. And I, I don't know if we'll be doing, like like consecutively season to season to season but right. we um we will we'll probably break them up a little bit but we will be we will be charting the journey of slasher which is available on netflix in the uk i don't know where it's available in the states i netflix as well uh cool. I, I believe they i think they bought it now and that's that's who's producing the cronin <laughs> of course right like, <laughs> right yeah no ruby slipped a stone into the <laughs> office of jeff netflix jeff netflix and all of a sudden he was like you know what's a great idea we should we should pay whatever uh we have to for slasher it's so weird that cronenberg's just decided to do an acting role in it though i don't know it's why not man why not i mean they've got to be shooting that thing in his backyard and he was just like sure why not yeah there'll be someone involved with it that he knows and that's generally how Cronenberg appears in things. Um, it's all directed so. by Brandon Cronenberg. It's an <laughs> unofficial sequel to Possessor. Oh, dude. Um, yeah, so we're, we're going to be doing that anyway. So that's that's our next stint. That'll be coming early right. 2021. Um, and yeah, we invite you to join us. Uh, yes. <laughs> Don't watch the show, <laughs> but you can join mm. us. I or, Yeah, don't watch it. But I think you can get away with just listening to us for this one, but... If you want to see some truly bad television, the yep. first couple of episodes of Slasher are certainly that. Um, <laughs> but, Duncan, where can people reach you if they want mm-hmm. to get their grubby meat hooks on you in between now and the next time they hear you on this show? Uh, you can check me out on Podcast Under the Stairs. Uh, it can be found anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Or you can go directly to the website, tputzcast.com. And keep your eyes peeled for a couple of visits from Bo Ransdell this month. When Bo joins myself and Doug Tilly to do a massive director's conversation on the newly Oscar award winning director Bong Mm -hmm. Joon-ho as we go through his entire filmography. But Bo has also agreed to... And at this point, I can only imagine the movie review is just going to be us doing bad Muppet impressions, which will be right this time instead of just bringing them into shows where they're not at. Uh, and awful Michael Caine impressions when we sit down and do Muppet's Christmas Carol, which my listeners foolishly selected as movie, which is a Christmas horror movie that I most really want to hear reviewed on podcasts under the stairs if i'm going through it bo's going through it so yeah i don't know how much of a review it's gonna be it's just gonna be (laughs) us goofing on it it's just gonna yeah there's not that there is no review coming of that movie that is just just gonna be bad bad (laughs) really bad impressions like for the entire fucking show and that is what my listeners deserve so yeah check that out please hello there (laughs) Kermit. Oh, this is him, uh, M- M- Master Kermit. Oh, just, some people just want to watch the world burn. Some people just want to watch the world burn, Mister Kermit. Yeah, yeah. well, it, there. Yes, as you can hear, the cane impressions will be terrible, um, <laughs> but it'll be fun. Uh, if you want to check out uh, any any of my stuff, uh, the the podcast you can listen to are Pick Six Movies, where we just started. Uh, a new season called Once in a Lifetime, where we are taking six movies from the Lifetime uh, Television Network, um, starting with a movie entitled A Very Nutty Christmas, in which a soulless uh, monster uh, in the form of a nutcracker seduces a, a bakery owner. Um, mm-hmm. Then there's uh, Hero Hero Go Show. There's uh, obviously this show. What am I forgetting, Duncan? Is that it right now? That feels right. That's yeah. That's what you've got right now, my friend. And then uh, for other stuff, uh, there there's plenty of other shows. If you go to check out legionpodcast.com, 
of uh, just about any type of uh, podcast you're you're interested in listening to. Um, also, you can uh, find more stuff on youtube.com forward slash Legion podcast, where we post some uh, video versions of the podcast. You can go to twitch.tv forward slash Legion podcast, where you can see me uh, streaming a bunch of dumb video games and occasionally doing voices there as well. Um, and facebook.com forward slash Legion podcast. If you want to keep up with everything that's coming out and that's it. Uh, so Duncan, there is nothing left uh, for us to do to end this season of mm-hmm. Duncan and Bo Come Correct, a.k.a. Duncan and Bo Go to Lovecraft Country, than to say to you, say goodnight, Duncan. Goodnight, Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, but I ain't them as rough. <laughs> <laughs> Zoinks! <laughs> Oh, man. Like it's uh, a season finale, man. <laughs> what? Ruby that. <laughs> hey, that's it. We're, go home. You're still here. <laughs>